Hey everyone, and welcome to Design the Future, an event we've created to inspire you with new ideas, thought-provoking discussions, and creative experiences to explore better ways to work, live, and design the future of travel. I want to acknowledge that this year has taken a toll on all of us, on our businesses, our communities, our personal well-being. It's affected us all in innumerable and constantly evolving ways. So much so that I don't even need to name any one of the dozens of calamities that have happened throughout the year. We all feel it. But I think there is good news. There is a silver lining here in that in times of mass uncertainty, we have a window and an opportunity to reflect and define the future for ourselves. We've learned to adapt and make do with what the new normal looks like right now, but what comes next? Is there a better way to operate? And if so, how do we get there? So that's what we're talking about today. Let's bring humanity back to travel. By redefining on what purpose and quality of life means to us in these convergent times right now, and to lead with empathy and responsibility in everything we do as we look to the future. And in a way that goes beyond a marketing campaign or PR strategy and comes alive in the spaces and solutions that we create for travelers and the culture and community we're a part of every day. If you know Skift, undoubtedly you've seen this line before. Travel's the world's largest industry. Let's start acting like it. Well, I'd like to offer another interpretation of that, which is travel enables the best of humanity and that our actions impact everyone. You know, travel is really what connects humanity together. All the people and places unites us, breaks down barriers, regardless of culture, race, religion, wherever you might be in the world, it's what brings us together. So that means we in the travel industry have an opportunity to have a positive impact on the human condition. There are means to create a more better positive human experience. But that's what we're talking about today, leading with empathy and responsibility through the spaces, solutions, culture, and communities that are our industry affects each and every day. The speakers we've lined up are some of the brightest and most creative minds in their fields from architecture and design, air travel and mobility, hospitality, advertising, wellness, and more. And while they may come from different sectors and walks of life, what they do share is an intentional, human-centered approach in all their work and a willingness to experiment, innovate, and execute on the ideas that will drive society forward. Regardless of your own sector or role, we guarantee that you'll find insights, inspiration, and tactics from each of these sessions that will resonate with you. Throughout the day, we'll also be giving you a first look at the 2020 Skift Idea Award winners. With hundreds of entries across the 14 categories we had for this year, these brands and projects represent some of the best in innovation, design, and experiences across travel. Today's just a preview of these results, and a bigger announcement will come next week, and we'll, yeah, we'll include more details around the project, including video and links. In the meantime, we've added a link to see all the amazing finalists below the live stream player. I'd also like to give thanks to our amazing panel of judges for lending their time and expertise in reviewing and scoring these entries. And you'll be hearing from a few of them today, including Aaron Walton, the CEO of Walton Isaac Sin Agency, and Suchi Reddy, who will kick us off in a few moments this morning. One last logistics note before we get started. If you've attended a Skip virtual event before, you may have noticed that we're not in our usual virtual event platform which means we don't have a native chat feature built in. In the spirit of experimentation and finding new ways to collaborate in the virtual world we're all living in, we're trying something new. Use the hashtag design the future on Twitter or LinkedIn to share your thoughts, start conversations and connect with one another. These are the platforms you guys use every day. So outside the virtual event ecosystem, start those ideas, have those conversations, connect with each other. I also want to shout out that we've created something called the Design the Future Resource Library, which is a place to share your ideas and practices for the way you work and live that may inspire others. From well-being practices to how you stay productive in the virtual world, your creative process, or anything else that might inspire you to live, work, and design in better ways. After the event, we'll be sharing a roundup of these along with uh, answers collected from our speakers as well. Finally, I'd like to thank Accor, who has partnered with us to help make today's event possible. Later on today, you'll hear from Damien Perot, who's Accor's SVP of design, to discuss design's role in shaping society. Uh, stick around for that. 
So that's it. We're excited to start the show. Thank you so much for being with us today. And let's get ready to design the future. Oh, and if you're in public, wear a mask. guest today is architect and designer Suchi Reddy, whose New York-based practice, ReadyMade, creates spaces and installations guided by the principles of neuroaesthetic design, the study of how our brains respond to the design of our surroundings. Let's take a quick look at what that looks like in practice. The way this project is unusual is that we are actually pursuing a principle. I really believe that form follows feeling, and feeling is really what space and architecture are about. Space actually affects people. Design matters. It's why we spend the time making the decisions we do. Those things that we as designers intuit, neuroscience is now proving have an effect. Google created an exhibition that is showing design's impact on our biology. The way that I explain neuroaesthetics is really simple. It's basically how your brain changes on the arts. When you have a heightened aesthetic experience, like a piece of music, a sunrise, things that really elevate your everyday experiences, they change you. They change your biology, they change your mood, they change your emotion. I called Suchi Reddy and I said, taking the neuroaesthetic principles, could you create three different rooms that would evoke different responses? The goal is to see how people resonate with space and to really find out whether what they think they resonate with is what their body is actually resonating with. We respond to the aesthetics of our environments, whether we realize it or not. The band can demonstrate with data from the sensors that actually is happening. Heart activity, respiratory activity, skin temperature, skin conductance. We figure out from the data which room is the one that feels the calmest or the most at ease for people. Does your physiology feel most peaceful? I think it's what people are searching for. The space between the notes, the place where they can come and just be. The interiors where we work and where we live have a deep impact on our well-being. We always known it and believed in it, but we haven't been able to quantify it and prove it. You enter a space and it's like, I, I like it, but why? This is about data used as a mirror back to yourself. Data is just a bunch of numbers, and we wanted to make it artistic in its expression. It can be really hard to put an aesthetic experience into words. But suddenly, by combining science and technology, we get new language. We've selected yeah. room two. How's the room now? You were the most calm in. Maybe a watercolor can tell more than a thousand words. Technology has the ability to help you know yourself better. The problems of the future are only going to become more complicated. Solutions have to happen in this collaboration of technology, the arts, and science. CT, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, Matt. Thank you for having me. It's always mm -hmm. fun to, to watch that film. I hope everyone enjoys it. No, I think I came across that sometime last year, probably right after the Milan uh, event where that, that, that was shown at and was just so blown away by, you know, actually being able to track the science and the sort of psychological uh, impact that actual spaces have. So, you know, in that video, you, I think we heard someone say, I like it, but why? Mm -hmm. uh, 
tell me a, a bit more about neuroaesthetic design and how spaces and these aesthetic experiences affect our brains and bodies. Well, um, let me backtrack a little bit. Um, so um, I'm an architect and uh, from the early days of my training, I always was, I had this epiphany when I was about 10 years old that the house that I lived in made me a different person than my friends. Don't ask me how I knew this, I just knew it. And I couldn't explain it. I knew it didn't make me better. It just made me different. And so what I really wanted to do when I became an architect is really make spaces that make people feel their best. And yes, you have to make them function. Yes, you have to make them work. Yes, you have to make them efficient. Yes, you have to make them meet budgets. But I, the, but the driving force of my work was really how do you feel? How do you feel in these spaces? And first of all, kudos to you for you know taking something that's so far out, really um, outside of the travel industry, but bringing it back to that because I do think it's extremely important. Like when we travel, we're in these spaces that really affect us, and in some ways, they're very closed and tight spaces. They have an even bigger impact in terms of their. You know, so I do think that this is actually a super germane discussion that your industry should be having and in interface with ours to, to really see how we can put our minds together. But I, um, so the idea really between behind neuroaesthetics is that, and it, this is a field that was, it's, it's fairly new as far as the uh, sciences go. And it was started about 10 to 15 years ago uh, when uh, psychologists and scientists started really looking at and doing studies about how different aspects of space and different aspects of experience really affect us. And um, I found out about it about 10 years ago. And since then, it's become a research passion of mine um, that dovetailed really well into the original ethos of my practice, which was form follows feeling. So, you know, um, really, it's a question of bringing um, science and art together. And uh, a lot of it is finding a common language that we can speak so that we're all understanding each other, because science needs the same result um, under the same conditions 250 times, let's say, before it can be a thing you know, and artists and creative people into it and work very differently. So it's really understanding how do we bring those, both of those things together to arrive at a platform that will give people um, usable information, you know? So it's very much a field in, in process and information, but I think uh, no one would disagree that, and especially now during this pandemic, when people are spending so much time in their homes, um, sometimes against their will, um, that the the quality of that and the nature of that is really affecting them. You know, it's really, um, no pun intended, bringing the point home. Huh. So, you know, we need to um, really make the most of that, I think, um, as architects especially, to yeah. um, expand the view of people who, um, who we engage with. And, and I, I think we have an image from that video too that, that we could probably pull up just to give people um, a little bit of a still so they could um, see what we're talking about from that video or in case anyone's just joining in now and missed it. So from what I've gathered from this project that you worked on with Google was that you created a series of spaces that were meant to evoke a different physiological mental response to the people mm -hmm. who were interacting with it. And Google mm -hmm. actually went and tracked it with wearable technology um, so there is actually some science backing this. What what were some of the things that you found in terms of what resonates with us when it comes to color, or texture, or scent, whatever it might be? Well, one of the major uh, partners in this was also the International Arts and Minds Lab at the Brain Sciences Institute of Johns Hopkins University. I had been also working with them on a hospital room um, that we were looking at, a prototypical hospital room where we were looking at how the design could probably um, better the rates of, of children who were um, so suffering from disorders of consciousness or coming out of comas, et cetera. And so this was sort of um, part of a continuing conversation about how space can actually affect people. And so, um, uh, the science aspect of it um, really came from them. And we figured out, you know, there were these um, few notes that we wanted to hit. And then I was given kind of uh, this, this series of kinds of feelings to evoke. And I was given the license to interpret that and say, well, I think that this could, this condition or this, um, combination of elements could do it. So the three different rooms, really, there were three different spaces, three different experiences. One of them was, um, I reverted back to thinking about um, 
uh, the caves that we all came from. And really the first one was sort of curved and the walls were made of mud, which is the image on the right that you see. Everything was supernatural. You could touch everything. There was a, a felt uh, tapestry that was that was made in that, which you don't see in this picture, but it's like, uh, you know, uh, 16 meters long and it's made of the dyes of flowers. And, you know, there were all these kinds of real earthy things. And I curated the rooms with books about making, about poetry, about eating, about reading, those kinds of things that have to do with a very um, direct connection to the body. And then the second room, which is the one that the image that you see on the left was meant to be much more vibrant and much more playful. And so I used color and, you know, the function in the rooms was the same. It was always a living room and a dining room so that we didn't change too many things. And in between the rooms, we also had what we designed as an antiquate chamber. So it was a sort of like a palette cleanser you know you went from one but then all your senses kind of shut down because the colors and uh, it was a small space and it was you know with sound insulation so everything was shut down and then you went into the next room where you had different sounds different smells different colors different experiences and the colorful room i did i filled actually with pop-up books which are a huge fascination of mine i so want to live there i want to live in that colorful room it just made me so happy to look at and people loved it, you know, because you have to give people something to do in these days. If you're going to ask someone to be in a room for 10 minutes, not on their phones and not talking to anyone and just allowing their body to respond to something. Um, that was, in fact, quite a difficult task. So we had to figure out how to keep people engaged that would still be remain along the lines of what we were trying to work with. And then we gathered the data, not just to say to people, here's a set of rules, because anytime you try to do that, given the variety of human beings and our neuroplasticity, you're setting yourself up for failure. But what you can do is set up a sort of a set of guidelines. You know, you could say, here's the point of the, the installation was just to show people to reflect back to them in this kind of beautiful way of that kind of watercolor mandala that you saw in um, the film that space matters, design matters. It's really affecting you on other levels than you think. It's not just a trend. It's not just um, how does it work, but it's actually making you feel something and it's making your body react in a certain way. So once we know that there's so much work to do in this field, you know, tons of work to do, which is- I know, which is it, 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 it seems just incredibly difficult for us to be able to cover that in, in just 20 minutes here. No, yeah. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. You could spend weeks and weeks and weeks just scratching exactly. the surface yeah but the thing is that we saw diverse reactions to everything and a lot of times people were surprised they thought they liked something and it showed up as something else which is really what we were kind of hoping for because it would have been rather boring to say well i like that and yes i know you know um but it was extremely interesting actually and very valuable i think and very um it opened a lot of people's minds yeah, I mean, and and I think just from the people who are watching and watching that video and and hearing you talk about this, you for certain uh, design with a lot of intention and a lot of respect for that end user, that human being on the other end. Um, and this was obviously an art installation, but you've also done a lot in the public space as well. Um, and I've seen a lot of themes in your work around sort of empathy, justice, um, trying to unite us in times like this, especially which is such a big divide. Um, and of course, you know, the big news this week, we have a new administration coming, uh, including the first black multiracial vice president, which everyone is psyched about. Uh, first of all, how's your how's your mood feeling uh, with that news? And, you know, how can we use public spaces to have that intention that sort of brings people together or makes things, you know, that, that actually can physically unite us uh, as humans? Well, I'm extremely hopeful. I will say that, you know, um, my faith uh, in in systems and in people um, is restored and um, which had taken a few hits, I think, and for everyone. And, um, you know, it's, it's so heartening. And I think public space is really this incredible artery of, of bravery that of spaces for bravery, as I see them, that runs through our cities and our in our towns and our world, you know, that we can use anything that connects us, you know, and we see that now, like in New York City, where I am. And when you see all the restaurants in the West Village, where I live, spilling out onto the streets, concerts from the churches, spilling out onto the corners, from the synagogues, from everywhere. You know, this kind of connection, this feeling that public space can generate, it's really an underused asset in most cities. 
And so I think that these are great places to make um, available, to make sure that they're equitable, to make sure that they're welcoming to people of all different kinds, abilities, um, races, you know, economic class, et cetera. And, you know, public art, like for instance, we did um, a public installation, which I think you uh, saw in Times Square called X last year, which was about um, justice um, being the expression of love and community, which I'm paraphrasing a quote from Dr. Cornel West, but, and love being, um, um, the tenderness being the expression of love in private. And how do we look at this architectonically? And we made a huge X, we made a shape under the X, this became a place for people to gather. When they stepped on the platform, it glowed brighter. It showed them the power of love, the power of community. These kinds of interventions, I think, are really important, especially in this kind of time of entrenchment. You know, by by no means do I do I think we're past the, the period of turmoil. We we are entrenched. We are divided, and we need to find ways in which to bridge those gaps. And I think, you know, certainly as you began by saying, travel is one of those ways in which we the world gets connected. You know. Public space is a way in which worlds get connected. So this sculpture that you're showing there, you know, we um, I took two uh, uh, planes and said at the intersection of of division, if you insert a unifying shape like a circle, what you actually see is a heart underneath. It makes um, a heart shape, and um, I inscribed in there into difference, add equality, and find love. And this was, it was 20 feet tall. It stood up, you know, and reflected all of the lights of Times Square surrounding it. Um, lots of people from around the world saw it. Um, it was hugely successful. And I think we need, um, we can do this on lots of levels. It doesn't have to be through public sculpture. It can just be through making spaces accessible, you know, providing support to the food vendors that are lining the sides of the streets. Whatever we do to make our communities come closer together, which I think we have a lot of tools at our disposal, um, we should be making the most of those at this time. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think a lot of our audience here, I think that will resonate as well, even if they're not in the art space or in you know any sort of public workspace. Uh, you know, there's lobbies, there's stations, there's outdoor spaces that are really meant to, and, and I think it's really been a trend in travel and hospitality for a while now in terms of the whole convergence of locals and travelers and all of that sort of melding into one. And I think from this year, it's really sort of accelerated that uh, at such a pace, if you're ready for it or not. Yeah. We're all like work, work and life, those lines have blurred completely. Travel, local, those lines have blurred too. Um, and when it comes to, you know, are, are there any sort of other examples you can give of, of what brave spaces might look like either, you know, if it's a real example that people might know that we could sort of talk, talk through, or, you know, is there a sort of an archetype or a framework for, for what, what it means to build a brave space? I, I think it's mostly, it's more, you know, a, a social framework. I think it begins with people thinking about their cities as spaces for expression of bravery, uh, for expression of courage and for expression of unity. And like you were saying, you know, like in travel, in lobbies, you know, if you come into a hotel uh, um, and if, or if you're in a lounge of some kind, and if there is a message there that can actually reunify that, you know, that can amplify this idea of lots of different kinds of people coming together. You just take, you, you can take Times Square as a perfect example without sculptures, without anything on a day-to-day on -day basis. You know, um, recently on Saturday when the results were announced, it was like Times Square, like we hadn't seen it in a year, you know, like full of people. <laughs> and no all longer a ghost town. No, and, and and you know, to be to be very honest, it has not been a ghost town. The people who have been using Times Square have been all the essential workers because they all take transit. It's a transportation hub, you know. So we think about mm -hmm. like transportation travel, these kinds of hubs that naturally lend themselves to appealing to a huge demographic, to me, are an incredible opportunity. So whether that hub is a, a square in a city, whether it's a street, whether it's a lounge in an airport, whether it is you know, a, a lobby in a hotel, these places congregate by their nature, people of very different walks of life, people of very different uh, views, standards, there's nothing unifying who walks in there. You know, and I think these make them a really kind of a rich, fertile breeding ground for really trying to get a message out about community, of having people feel community. Because the one thing I will say is that regardless of what community that is, if people feel like they are welcomed and that there is a community and that they are being taken care of, 
which is what you need and which is what you know essentially the the principle of designing something to suit somebody does for them you know it shows them that this has been made for you this is responding to your needs it makes you feel taken care of and that's really important for all of us as humans it's something that everybody in the travel business tries to do you know you want to make sure that your clients feel like their environment suits them it's made for their comfort that it's made to ease their life and take the stress out of the out of the equation if we can do those things with these spaces that are natural spaces, natural containers for the idea of community, I think we've got a huge, huge opportunity that we shouldn't yeah. be. And I think it's a good time right now to, you know, be a bit more experimental and, and try some things out that you might not have done last year. I mean, I think right now with people traveling less, um, but people really wanting to travel and that sort of pent up demand when it does sort of start to trickle or, or flood through again, it's going to be much more intentional, much more meaningful. So like the exp the space, the experience, the brand, whoever you're choosing to interact with, you know, that's going to be your brand for yeah. some reason. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's really interesting to sort of think about that in terms of how we experiment and, you know, building something that's not one size fits all, but, you know, fits a, you know, a holistic tribe mentality for some yeah. sort of group or some sort of person for to yeah. really fit that vibe. And you know we, we have just a few minutes left here, and and one thing I did want to add into in terms of creating more, you know, diverse and ex inclusive spaces, and you know, especially in this time. I mean, I think all of America and much around the world too. There's been sort of a reckoning with the Black Lives Matters movement, with everything that's been happening, George Floyd protests. Um, I think a lot of a lot of us want to do better. A lot of us want to embody mm -hmm. this idea of community um, wherever we are, whether we're living or traveling, whatever that might be. But how do we design more inclusive spaces when, and you might know this step better, uh, when only 17% of architects are women, 2% identify as black, and only 0.2%, 0.2% are black women. Well, you you know, you're gonna make me cry there. Yeah, um, this is this is a battle that I've been fighting all my life, and uh, the only way we can make it better is by doing what you do, by bringing. Uh, by shining a light on that, you know, so people know what are the reasons why those numbers are the way they are, because those opportunities are not there. Those um, uh, role models don't exist in the in the you know bigger frame of things. Like if you named you know the biggest ten architects in the world, you would uh, there was one woman and she passed away. You know there are like ten big firms that are mostly men. And, you know, these are the kinds of things that have to change. And I think that has to change not just in my profession, but it has to change all over you know, for this to be, for equality to not just be a word, for it to be really something that we believe in, I think we're gonna have to really work with that to, to, to make sure that we're providing those opportunities for people. So as we look to 2021, we have a new year, it's coming up fast. Is there anything uh, in particular that you're optimistic about? Well, I'm really looking forward to whatever my first trip for fun will be. Um, I've been traveling so much for the last few years, but it's been a very novel experience to be able to spend so much time in my 375 square feet of micro home, you know, as beautifully as I've designed it. And I love it. And I'm very happy here. Um, we were going to talk about that, too, by the way, just to, just to let everyone know, we did have a sort of a third segment around Suchi's 375 square foot micro apartment. I don't think we're going to actually get to it because the rest of the conversation has been so good. But we do have some links later and you can, you can sort of take a look at that. Sorry. It's just super tiny, but, you know, I designed it so that I could have a dinner party for eight and, you know, be comfortable and have at least you know, six places to sit, which is my idea of luxury. Uh, so I don't have one chair and that's it. You know, I need to have like variety in the, and options. Options are the thing. Um, but yeah, so I lost track of what you were asking me. What was I looking forward to in 2021? Yeah, anything to be optimistic about. Oh my God, I think there's so many things to be optimistic about. So many, so many. I think we can look forward to a new way of thinking about everything. I think one thing this time has done for us is if something wasn't working, in our systems, in our lives, in our personal lives, it's turned over the underbelly and made you not able to ignore it. So we have to fix all of these broken things. I'm looking forward to fixing as many broken things as I can you know, lay my hands or eyes on, uh, or my talents and skills on, I should say. And I'm really looking forward to being in um, physical community with people again, you know, and, and really enjoying travel again, actually, because travel is one of my huge inspirations. It's really, 
um, what lights my fire and gets me going and thinking about how people across cultures and different places do what they do and really feeling and sensing the flavors of those communities. So I'm really looking forward to that. Well, Suki, I so greatly appreciate you being here and, and I'm sure our audience does as well. And just to let everyone know, we have a ton of great other videos that we did not have enough time to play for here, um, including that the, the X project in Times Square, which is just, by the way, a great, just a fantastic video that like sort of brings a tear to my eye a little bit, but we'll, we'll, we'll send that out in the links um, with everything later on today or late later this week. Sichi, thank you so much for joining us today. Matt, it was my total pleasure. Thank you for having me and thank you for, for being so pleasant to talk to and so hopeful. This is great. Yes. Thank you. Be well. All right, you too. Bye. For our next session, we're going to take a trip to outer space with Mike Mahoney, Program Management Director at Teague. What does it take to design a livable environment in a zero gravity condition? And how might that inform how we create better experiences in confined spaces like airplanes, trains, cars, or hotel rooms here on Earth? Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. I am thrilled to be here and especially excited to talk about the topic I have to show you today, which is space. At T, we've been designing for space habitats and vehicles for over 30 years now, and I continue to be amazed at how the way in which we design for space can influence and provide learnings for human-centered design here on Earth. And vice versa, how the ways in which we design and leverage consumer design principles here on Earth can provide a better human experience in space as well, too. So over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to take you on a journey into outer space, specifically a trip to Mars, and show you what a future habitat could look like in that journey, and then translate those elements back to real world examples here on Earth. In doing so, we'll talk about why it's important not just to look at the form and functionality of a space, but also how you interact and experience it, and why that's especially important for smaller confined spaces like hotel rooms, aircraft cabins, subways, trains, and even the our own remote work environments where many of us join today. But before we start, our journey begins with a blast from the past. Uh, humans have been dreaming about space for as long as we've been able to look up at the night sky and know that we have stars and planets scattered out there in a vast expanse. In 1958, Hilton teased at the idea of ordinary humans in space with a hotel that could orbit the Earth or even be on the moon. And a little over 10 years later, humans put their first steps on the moon. In the past like this, we've tended to think of space like something that's far away into our future. And I think for the most part, that's been true. But today, I think we're closer than we know to realizing the dream of ordinary humans in space. And I think the evidence is there. NASA has said that in the last 15 years of space, we've accomplished more than the first 50 years of aviation. And aviation eventually saw millions of people taking to the skies every single day. And just a few weeks ago, NASA awarded a contract to Nokia to provide 4G cell phone service to the surface of the moon. Which is why today I unveil the Hilton Expanse, a new hotel which will orbit the Earth from 250 miles up and provide awe-inspiring views of Earth, the moon, and the space beyond. Go ahead and look for yourself. Now in the Hilton app, you can book a stay for you and your family, assuming you can get a ride there. So obviously, I'm kidding, just to be clear, this is not an actual hotel in space yet anyway. Hilton has not approved this. But I think in the not so distant future, this could be a reality. And maybe even Accor Hotels, who's with us today, is secretly planning something just like this. If they are, I have some recommendations on how they should approach the future for design of humans in space and how these principles could influence better design for our spaces here on Earth as well. First, an acknowledgement that safety is paramount. Space is a dangerous place, much like the early years of aviation were. And the highest priority of design must be to sustain life. All else must follow. On that foundation, we build the human experience because through our research, 
we, we know that we must help protect emotional and psychological needs of humans, especially as more and more people live in working space and for longer periods of time. Their happiness and well being has to be considered. So, first, in designing for confidence, adding familiar human experiences through clear, simple to understand, and intuitive environments, and using visual, auditory, and lighting cues to support it. Next is comfort. Designing for familiar surroundings and human connection to our environments through soft textures, color, light, and materiality. When successfully achieved, this is about driving meaning and purpose from our surroundings. And then finally, control. Control is choice in interaction and customization. Elements that can be adapted to a user's individual preferences and derive a sense of meaning and purpose and control in that environment. And then also opportunities for micro-nesting, especially in smaller spaces that are ordinarily busy. So to sum these up, these principles together become our pillars of trust for the human or guest experience and are based on the foundations for happiness and well-being. Because to be isolated in a confined area for long periods of time will require confidence, comfort, and control on top of the safety standards already in place. What does this look like in action? So let's begin our pre-flight journey. We are about to embark on a 190-day journey to Mars through 140 million miles in a zero-gravity environment. You'll be accompanied by three other passengers here. Throughout this journey, I'll show you a handful of snippets on what that day could look like throughout the journey. As you begin day one in the journey to Mars, you'll see how we've designed your space through three unique examples. As we do, I'll highlight those themes and elements and then translate those and tie those to examples here on Earth. In doing so, even if you don't believe that you'll be directly affected by space in the near term or in the future, I'll show you how these things might also influence the work you do here uh, on Earth. All right, so let's begin. Today we take a tour of our living space module. The living space module features three main areas, a bedroom suite at the bottom there, a multi-purpose space at the top, and a green wall which bridges the areas together. First to the bedroom. Imagine you're slowly waking up in bed on your first day of the journey, settling into a quiet moment where you can start to organize your thoughts around the day ahead, perhaps even joined by your partner or spouse. I'll give you a moment to take in the scene. And yes, that is a couple there sleeping on what appears to be a wall because they can, this is zero gravity. And it's not really a wall, this is about the orientation and the way we see this scene. As you look at the scene, I'll talk about how this could influence design for sleep spaces like hotels. First, in design for lighting. Lighting scenes can be used to promote sleep health, mimicking the sunrise in the morning for a fresh start to the day, slowly transitioning to brighter natural light for wakefulness and productivity. Personally for me, one of the hardest things about staying in a hotel is having to use the blackout curtains to block out night at li light at night. And then that same blackout curtain is blocking the natural light in the morning, which makes it, hard, makes it harder to get up in the morning, especially in different time zones. Next is maximizing utilization of the space, which could open up new revenue opportunities. You already see this in hotel chains like Marriott, rolling out day passes for certain properties for those looking for a space to work remotely. As they continue to roll these out, they'll have to ensure that these same rooms that have been designed primarily for sleep also cater to the needs of their day guests. Lighting, architecture, and features will need to serve both unique needs and be developed in tandem. Next are digital touch points that can remember guest personal preferences and be used to control the environment while anticipating and providing relevant information and a connection to home. A digital experience could be agnostic to this screen here. It could transition between rooms, like a Netflix episode that can easily transition from your mobile device to a screen on the back of the aircraft seat to the hotel room here. And then finally, a way for your family to connect directly to you, as seen by the message here. And then finally, organizing a space efficiently to simplify and minimize mental clutter, while also making good use of space you have and simplifying architecture. 
and then integrating storage into walls or other furniture like the cubby seen here to provide more livable space. Next, we travel to the green wall as part of our living module. Imagine you're partway into your journey to Mars. Your days are busy and filled with important work and routine, but you also crave a space to get away. So your daily routine includes a moment of solace and privacy here. As you take this in, I'll also talk about the design themes here that can translate into our lives, actually just about anywhere. First, by bringing natural green living elements into spaces normally devoid of it. I could imagine an airport lounge embracing this approach mostly in full form. How often are we in indoor environments that feel impersonal and sterile? There's plenty of research that shows the impact on mental and emotional wellness through a connection to nature. Next, in designing for the seams in our lives and our journeys, too often we're focused on eliminating the seams and making our lives more seamless. I think there's an opportunity here to focus on those and make those better spaces for us, bridging spaces together with natural elements to promote wellness like you see. And then looking for opportunities to micronest or provide privacy in normally stressful areas or busy places like airports, aircraft cabins, trains, and buses. And especially areas that don't normally get the attention because they're so transitory, but have been shown to be the most stressful points in a journey like security lines. And then finally, for designing for multifunctionality and inclusivity in features up front, and to make them a more natural part of the environment. The hand or footholds that you see here, which she is um, holding herself into the space with, provide light, water, nutrients to the plant life. Here on Earth, these, these types of handles or other necessary features that ordinarily stand out could be integrated to provide lighting, scents, or sounds to a space or be covered in materials that complement and blend into the environment. Finally, we enter the multi-purpose space. This is an area that promotes flexibility and multifunctionality because space is limited, and we need to provide a richer variety of uses and experiences within it. The area you see here can be converted into a recreation module, a worker exercise module, and a kitchen module. Today, I'll convert to a kitchen module so you can see how important it is to provide a sense of community through design. To deploy any one of these modules, you first use one of these digital touch points by flipping the switch. This disengages the door from the wall and allows users to remove them. When the doors pop open, they float freely and can be magnetically snapped to the floor. And then behind these doors, you can see the kitchen module, which has room for food storage, refrigeration, and heating. And then finally, the countertop surface flips out and is a vacuum downdraft table, which helps pin food to the surface while you're preparing it in zero gravity. And then when you go to eat, it helps keep the food on the surface as well too. So now imagine you're on the final days of your journey approaching Mars. You and your fellow astronauts are getting more and more excited about reaching your destination and what lies ahead. It's a time to celebrate the journey in a fun social way and acknowledge how important your fellow crew members have been to your health and well being. A time to bond over food and drinks. As you look over the scene, I'll draw parallels once again to our design spaces here on Earth. But before we do, yes, they are wearing jeans in space. Um, it's funny because of all the feedback that we get on the scenes, that's the comment that comes up the most is that jeans in space are not credible and i would tend to agree that that's true so if you're thinking that no need to give me feedback on that it's already been said as you look at the scene i'll talk about the design elements here as well too first in design for different lighting scenes to promote mood there's a lot of science behind colors and their psychological effects certain shades have like the warm campfire or candlelit like tones here in doing so, you could promote social connection and foster a sense of community among people who ordinarily wouldn't find themselves together in a space, like coworkers or strangers in a hotel or airport or a group coming together on a trip for the first time. And by combining lighting with architecture, as you see here, you can make a space feel larger. Next, in multifunctionality and flexibility of spaces so that they can be transformed for different uses and moments. 
Some hotels are already embracing this by providing new amenities with personal branding touches in their lobby areas, like cozy bars with foosball, fireplaces, and spaces that during the day can also serve as work areas, blending the line between work and play, which is one of the trends this year highlighted by Skift called augmented hospitality. The Marriott Moxie brand is a great example of this, and I encourage you to check that out. Next, small spaces like the one here could also be designed into hotels so that certain blocks of rooms come together and could share a common space that turns into a communal area like this at night, or a recreation room, or workout area during the day, quickly converting between the configurations. And finally, these personal touches, materials, textures, and lighting and colors can be used to build brand identity and foster an emotional connection to it. While you might not be able to embrace zero gravity with floating votives like this, um, I encourage you to look past the constraints that are a normal part of our world, much like zero gravity is considered in space, and find unique opportunities that can provide a wonderful positive experience. Together, all of these elements here and the ones I've shown you build upon the pillars of trust and human happiness. And they apply just as much to what we're doing in design for small spaces today here on Earth. So I thank you for your time today. I hope I've left you inspired and also at the same time impressed upon you how important it is to design for better human experiences everywhere. After all, our design challenges here on Earth aren't too dissimilar from the ones that we'll see in our future in space. Thank you.
looking forward to this conversation. Hi, Carolyn. Great to see you too. And so am I. Mia, if there's anything the pandemic accelerated, it's the importance of well-being, particularly as it applies to how we live, work, and travel. Now, I know you, Mia. You know me. And I'm sure for many of us who are listening in this industry, we were spinning out of control, right? Um, we were running through airports, we were sleeping all over the world, we were working around the clock, and that became the norm for so many years. And then the pandemic hit, right? And we were forced inward, both physically and emotionally. And after months of living like this, there has been this huge realization that there has to be a better way to design the future that's more fulfilling that's more empathetic, responsible, and just overall better for us as humans. So Mia, let's start there. Is uh, there some silver lining in this crisis as it relates to designing the future with well-being at the core? Absolutely. And I could not agree more with everything that you just said. <laughs> I personally uh, resonated with me and professionally with you too. Um, I have been calling uh, COVID-19 as the great catalyst for not just the business of wellness and well-being, for the well-being of people, planet, and community. And I really think one of the gold linings of 2020, and I say gold, not silver, because it's- Yeah, that, I like that. <laughs> um, is that really our, our well-being, whether it be of ourselves individually, our families, our teams, the communities that we live in, in many ways, we got to a place where it was just spinning out of control, um, like you you said. And um, being forced to stop was uncomfortable, um, but really necessary. And I think the shift that's happened is that our wellness, not just our, our the, the safety and the immediate um, hygienic concerns that we have to stay safe and socially distance and so forth, but really the concert that takes place between our minds, our bodies, our emotions, our spirit, um, all of that was a nice to have before, and now it's a need to have. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's a, just a time to pause and reflect, right? So, right. see, we right. just talked about well-being from sort of like a personal um, experience, but what about well-being as it pertains to the workplace, right? Like, so up and through now, um, we've seen a lot of companies sort of take a shot at well-being, but I've got to say that I think most of it has been lip service, right? Like it's kind of like a nice to have, like you just said. And while they companies may have good intentions and they'll add in a couple of programs here and there, it, it didn't really feel like well-being was being integrated into companies' cultures. So what responsibility does a company have to its employees, especially now, as concern over mental health is at an all-time high? Quite honestly, Carolyn, I can't think of a greater responsibility. I think it needs to be priority one. You know, we had a mental health crisis in particular before the pandemic started, and we entered 2020 that way. 
Um, and now uh, we've all been forced to, to pause. Um, there's been massive change in our personal and professional lives and, and even in our own communities. And so I think companies um, really need to uh, take this into account. Um, that it's not just about the products and services and the perks that they might offer um, their their colleagues from a health and wellness standpoint, um, but it needs to be much more about how we work um, and really understanding, you know, what it takes to be well in the workplace and what it takes to foster a cult culture of well-being. Um, it's time that we shift from programs your workplace wellness program to the culture of living, working, and uh, being well at, at work. And so I do think um, that it's a huge shift. And I think companies really need to think of it now um, because it's directly tied to how they'll perform in the future and come out of this crisis. Yeah, yeah. And it's definitely will be on their report card, I think, along with everything else, just in terms of I think wellness is now, you know, rising to the top of that. So you are a foremost wellness uh, guru. Uh, and I mean, what advice do you have? Like, are there any tips that you have for if you're running a company? Uh, you know, if you're head of HR for a company, like we have a lot of um, company owners who are just listening now um, to, uh, you know, being as part of this conference. What advice do you have to improve health and wellness at work? Um. I have lots of advice, um, but I've tried to narrow it down to three tips that I find myself giving to um, business owners, even officials in, in public health, um, private, uh, public entities, whether you're large, small, publicly traded or not. And the tips I'm going to give actually um, don't cost any money. And I thought that was the way I, I people would, will like that. That's why I wrote <laughs> down my list. The number one thing. I would ask anyone who wants to really improve health and wellness on, at work is to ask the question, what is on your stop list? What have you decided strategically with the help of your leadership team and ideally have turned around and asked your colleagues and employees, what how are you going to stop doing? Most everyone I know, every company I know have cut their budgets, had to uh, lay off um, valued workforces, um, are having to do so much more with less. And I always ask myself, have you constricted what you do um, to st a similar degree? Um, what are you stopping in the spirit of focusing on what's critically important to your business, to your brand, to your core values? And that alone, that exercise alone will help you to uh, better prioritize and really positively impact the health and wellness of your colleagues who are working without some of their friends and half a budget, if any budget. And so um, I would say that's a huge um, activity. So that would be number one. The second thing I would say is to ask yourself that question that we just spoke about. You know, is wellness at work in your company if you're talking about it at all, about the perks and the products and services that you're offering to your colleagues, or is it about how you live and work? So what I mean by that is you might, if you're still operating on site, you have offered a gym. Maybe you've offered healthy uh, food and um, hydration in your uh, cafeteria. Um, maybe you've provided a digital a subscription to a Headspace or a Calm. To me, that's all just products or services that you're offering, but it's not exclusively focusing on how you are working. Um, how are you working together? Are you respecting people's time off? Are you um, really checking in with people one-on-one -on -one to understand um, what they now need to be successful um, if they're working at home or in their place of work? Have you really connected um, and really started to foster that culture uh, of well-being. And then the third tip I would give you is, is somewhat related to that. And that's really asking yourselves honestly, is your leadership team coming from a place that's focusing on what the challenges are every day, where the fear is or the firefighting? Or are you taking that moment, and I'm not suggesting that this is easy, but are you taking a moment to help people focus on what's going well, on what's going right? Are you taking a moment to be grateful uh, for those things and for the people that have helped make them happen? Um, really, that's something you need to focus on. So if I had to summarize those three things, it's what's on your stop list, 
is your wellness um, efforts really a program or a culture at work? And then three, is your leadership style coming from a place of challenges and firefighting? Or are you taking time to recognize and acknowledge the good? And um, those three things will actually help you make tremendous progress as we find ourselves uh, to 2021. Wow, I love that. I love that. And like you said, these are things that don't cost any money, right? So it's just really such a shift in being thoughtful and being caring and being empathetic um, to your coworkers. And um, yeah, I, I, I think that, um, and the stop list, oh my gosh, I got to start thinking about that because I'm sure I have a very long one I can go. Can, can, can compile. Uh, so we, yeah, we talked, yeah. to, you know, so we talked about, um, you know, wellness uh, in the workplace and also personal wellness. But now, what about wellness as it pertains to travelers, right? So, in response to COVID, hotels and airlines, um, they're all striving to make travelers feel safe by deploying a lot of safety standards and new technologies, and they're augmenting it a bit with um, hygiene theater. Um, to build traveler confidence, right? So right. how important is it, do you think, Mia, for hotels and airlines to continue with this messaging around safety? And ultimately, do you think it will impact loyalty um, to these brands in the long term? Or do you think it's just going to go by the wayside when we're past this? Um, I, you know, I really have, a, I would say, a short-term and longer-term view on this. Uh, in my opinion, um, you never get a second chance to make a first impression, but COVID has done that right. for travel, tourism, and hospitality. You know, for those companies and brands or even single unit properties or boutiques out there that are seeing this for the first time, um, I really feel like if your loyal customers, um, if they're returning to the, your properties or the friendly skies or eventually, hopefully the cruise industry, um, if they're coming back for their first time after being at home, and if you find a way to earn their trust and you make that great first impression or re-earn that trust, I honestly think you'll be mating for life. Um, I really think that you'll be earning uh, their loyalty for life because, you know, we can't underestimate the fact that um, our confidence has been shaken. Um, even those people that love to travel, whether for work or leisure, um, it can be scary sort of re-emerging and packing that suitcase again for the first time. And so I think um, companies and brands really need to look at this as almost like it's the first time and uh, people are coming to you. And if you earn their trust on the hygiene theater, as you said, um, you're just going to open the doors to all um these experiences uh, that you can really uh, bring to life more meaningfully once we get past um, the initial return and the initial fear of, of cleanliness and, and uh, safety. Um, and I also think on a personal level, and I would say this for, for um, owners and, and brands again around the globe, we have this amazing opportunity to make travel special again. I mean, think about that. Yes, um, we may travel a bit less, but it's gonna be more meaningful travel. And I think we were all talking about wanting to deliver incredible experiences, but those experiences were dramatically impacted by honestly um, how uh, busy and insane uh, travel had gotten. Um, so I really do feel like we have an opportunity to rethink that. I think we have an opportunity to make uh, travel special again. Um, both by the brands and then also um, as business leaders who are sending our, our colleagues on the road again. Um, and also with our families, um, as we're thinking about where we should go together, um, they might be, but I think they're gonna be so much more special. Uh, hit it out of the park. Have you, have you stayed in a hotel since the pandemic started? I have, I have. Yeah. And, and what, what's your take from that? I have to tell you, and I would say this from the moment I left the door until I stayed at a hotel, um, I thought the I felt safer uh, in the air than I did on the ground uh, in many ways. Mm -hmm. in terms of the steps that have been taken, it's incredible. Um, I think, you know, it's much like when you're cleaning house or moving, you get to throw out things you don't want and focus on the things that you do. I, I was very impressed with that. And my experience at a hotel um, was absolutely fantastic and i have to say i think it's because it was a boutique hotel it wasn't one of the big brands 
but they were so grateful to have me back and have my, yeah. my husband back. And, you know, it's almost like what we took for granted is, is once again, special. So yeah. um, I encourage people to get out there. You can do it safely. You can pick destinations where you feel comfortable. And of course it'll take some time, but um, I think the world is ready for us. Yeah, you know, at Skip Global Forum, one of the executives had said that um, they did research and it's like the, it, the biggest hurdle is getting people to take that first trip. But once they do, um, they will see and have more confidence to travel again. So I have not yet stayed at a hotel, but I, I intend to in the next few weeks. So and I think um, it's a scary thing yeah. to say right now, given where our, our figures are, but I do think we are going to start learning how to live with it. Um, I haven't done right. it recently but my first impression was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So, uh, you know, with w wellness, we know was a macro super trend um, before the pandemic, but this certainly has accelerated. What do you think when you look long-term, like think five years from now, um, what innovations do you see evolving now that um, you think will have legs and will stay uh, here for good in like five years from now or so? Well, uh, on, on the plus side, I think we have the opportunity to finally crack the nut on how to impact um, the lives of our consumers between hotel stays and travel stays um, and really enable them to take some aspects of travel home with them. You know, we've already started to see um, actually pretty early on uh, in the pandemic, uh, brands like uh, Six Senses, for example, that, that took Six Senses at home. Um, we've seen others do that. And those are things that we wish we could do before the pandemic, you know, somehow get them to take us home with them in some way, whether it's buying products and services remotely or so forth. So I really do expect to see more virtual aspects um, and really a, a rise again, a, a resurgence in digital commerce and, and consumers buying things that they love at uh, their favorite travel and tourism brands, for example, um, and bringing them home. And I think uh, for wellness specifically, um, I do think we're gonna see a rise in technology driven partnerships that will enable uh, more consumption of wellness uh, virtually. Um, but also um, uh, sort of coexist with uh, more meaningful, deeper, impactful uh, experiences while traveling. Um, I think we are going to focus on getting rid of unnecessary spaces or maximizing the space that we already have in new ways um, with products and services um, because I do not see... Um, I don't really see uh, demand for wellness uh, disappearing anytime soon. I think it's been put front and center. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. Like the extension of all those products, when you bring it home and you get to to hang on to those um, memories and those routines and the things that you've learned and, and all of that. So yeah, that makes sense. Um, so listen, we've been hearing a lot of people talk about the rise of revenge travel, right? Like we all have that pent up desire to get back out in the world. But is there something similar in wellness? Like, do you think that there's this pent up revenge around wellness? Absolutely. Um, and uh, I would say we saw a similar phenomenon, right, after 9-11. Um, you know, it's in times when we're sort of reminded of our mortality and, and how precious life is and experiences are. Um, that we have an increased willingness to spend money on ourselves um, really as a preventative measure to uh, ensure our longevity, live a richer life and so forth. Um, after 9-11, um, we saw things like massage uh, increasing again um, and people taking time for themselves. And I anticipate the same to be true um, really both during and, and after COVID. Um, you know, I think we'll find that the things we used to consume and feel guilty about, <laughs> perhaps it was a massage or visiting a hot spring or, you know, meeting with an energy healer or uh, having one-on-one -on -one, uh, yoga or meditation sessions and the list continues, um, these things will be um, far less, uh, will be more guiltless, I would say, moving forward because um, there's so much more science and evidence behind their effectiveness and their positive impact to our health and well-being. And I think um, people aren't tolerating uh, taking 
less care of themselves than they do um, for colleagues and guests and so forth. So I really do think that the evidence um, is really going to win out and people are going to be willing and wanting to spend time and money on, on products and experiences um, that really positively impact our health and wellness, whether that's at home or um, for business or even leisure travel, of course. Yeah, definitely. So I know we're running um, low on time here. So I guess in closing, listen, I, the pandemic, it, it's given us more time to focus, right? Like you mentioned on our physical self and on our mental well-being. Um, it gave us time to appreciate our families more, hopefully. <laughs> um, and, you know, and we're living, as you mentioned, we're, we're living and working smarter and more intentionally, right? And I know you just talked about all the things that um, we're doing and, you know, the, the um, doing it without guilt, which I think is really also an important um, note to emphasize. But Mia, okay, between us, right? after the pandemic, right, years behind, are we just going to go back to the way things were? Like, am I going to see you running through the airport with your suitcase, <laughs> <laughs> waving um, as you're on your way to Asia and then Europe and wherever else it may be? Like, what do you think? Do you think well, that we're, we've, did we change our ways? <laughs> my personal hope is that we will take one of those trips together. So let's put yes. that on our wish list. Um, but I, I, honestly, and I, I know everyone's going to think I'm just signing, sh shining sunshine. Um, I think it will be very difficult, both commercially and personally, to return to the way we lived and worked up until March of 2020. I mean, the reality is sometimes... <laughs> Life gives you exactly what you need in an unexpected package. And I really do believe that COVID-19 is just that. I mean, like you've mentioned, we, we slow down. We've spent more time with our families. We've been kinder, kinder to our neighbors, despite what politics might have you believe. Um, we have more respect for our teachers and for our healthcare workers. Um, we've had more time to appreciate and be in nature and we've learned how to do more with less and still be successful in our businesses. So I guess I'm going to answer your question with a question, which is who would want to go back to the way things were? That's true. That's true. Well, as you said before, Mia, it's the gold lining. I love that. Um, and uh, here is to you and to everyone else who is participating today to have uh, a future of good health, um, good balance, uh, and may we learn something from this moment. So thank you, Mia. Thank you for joining us. So happy thank to have you here. I'm toasting to that with my green tea. So thank there you, you so you go. Much. Cheers. Later.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Damien Perot, Global SVP of Design at Accor, to discuss design's role in the evolution of society and what that means for the future of hospitality as the lines between work, life, and play continue to disappear. Hey, Damien, how are you this morning? Or evening, I um, should say, for you in Paris. Morning, evening, whatever. I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, how are you well? I'm doing well. We're very excited to uh, have this show today and to uh, be talking around design and innovation through, through all possible forms. And, you know, I, I interviewed you a few years ago, and one of the quotes that you had said to me um, was that aesthetics are only 20% of the job of a good designer, and the rest is the ability to envision how people will live today and tomorrow. Uh, so how do you envision people will live tomorrow in the near future, and what role do you see design playing, uh, both in society and then maybe in travel as well? I, I would like to, to start by saying that, uh, you know, I strongly believe that uh, love is stronger than, uh, than anything and that will, that will never change. And that's why people will want to live, connect, discover, have fun, be surprised, and, and they also want to work and to work hard during this period where everyone has, let's say, reduced... Uh, the, the, the business is really impacted. People would like to come back to work. But the, in, the, in the near future, they do not want to compromise. They need more time. They need more quality time. But that also why people will want to, to do everything at 10 minutes from home. Immobility is the future. And hospitality is the answer. And that's where design and designers with have a crucial role to play. Designing the cities, hotels, with uh, new spaces, new functionality, a new life. And the process has already started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, speaking of the process already starting, I know Accor has really been on the idea of hybrid hospitality or augmented hospitality, something that you guys have been talking about in your taglines and even in your marketing too. But I think sort of that ethos is around work, life, and play, and a core as a brand and as a business trying to be where people are, not only when they're traveling, not only when they're as a hotel guest, uh, but those other moments that those other, you know, 50 weeks of the year where they might not be traveling. So with the pandemic, with everything that's going on in the world right now, and everything sort of converged on its own, do you feel like you guys have been prepared for this? Is this actually been some sort of opportunity or What's what what what's what's your whole outlook on that? Uh, for I mean we we start I think uh, since uh, five years to completely change uh, what we what we were doing uh, definitively and it really impact the design. Before we really used to to design our hotels uh, for travelers and that was the, the really the main the main focus and uh, and now it's completely different. We completely completely change that because first of all travelers when they when they when they travel they visit a city they would really would like to feel uh, uh, the country they want to to really uh, have that uh, local experience and the local experience is not really through design it's most of the time it's very gimmickal or or it's uh, premier degré as we say uh, as we say in, in in France they want to meet people and that's, that's the local experience. 
and uh, that's that's one of the reason and the other reason is is that there is lots of people uh, living around the hotel and just they just pass through the hotel and they never stop and there inside there is everything they need mm -hmm. so that's why now we we change we are completely changing the way we are designing hotel and we 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 design now place to live and we don't start for example with the reception desk with the transactional let's say experience in the hospitality uh, when you enter and uh, someone say uh, check in or check out we, we, we change that we remove the reception you enter in a place where it's, it's completely different you have a place to live to work to have fun to 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 do everything you 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 want and everything you need and then you meet people and that's mm -hmm. that's what people people want so of course, it's a it's a big change, and with this crisis and the pandemic, uh, it accelerates everything. It's it's like it's like having a new opportunity because people have more need close to the place they live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I think something I, I forget what the stat was. It was from the UN where we were tracking towards mass urbanization at such a crazy alarming rate. I think even now. Uh, I think 70% of US citizens are currently living in cities. Uh, but I do think we are also hearing right now a lot around this mass exodus, moving to smaller cities, moving to more rural areas. Um, with society changing so much, how might design dictate how residents are interacting with cities, um, either as travelers or as locals? And how, how are they sort of getting from point A to point B? Uh, in the midst of a pandemic as safety and health and concerns over confidence are really running amok everywhere. So, uh, so um, what, what is, is crazy, if, if you take uh, in, the, in the 2050, uh, more than uh, six, the increase of people living in the, in the, in the city will be uh, uh, around 60%. So it will be massive, even if, Few people will live out of the city. Uh, the density in the city would, would still be completely uh, would be uh, would be huge. Uh, let's say so. That's uh, that's also why uh, we need to completely change the way we are thinking today. Uh, for example, there is lots of project on uh, mobility uh, in order to 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 support that uh, that traffic. Uh, me, I, I I prefer to say that we need to work on immobility. Immobility e really is, is, is something very important because we need to absorb uh, that, that uh, increase of, uh, of, uh, of population. So we need to do everything we can in order that uh, people could do, let's say, 90% of what they need to do around, around, around where they live, a 10-minute 10, 10 walk, for example. Mm -hmm. And it will it will change everything, and and so we need to reinvent the mobility as well, and that's why we are working on how do we need to design the hotel, but how do we need also to 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 design the new mobility, in order to really create a totally different uh, experience uh, within the city, and that's fantastic. Do you have an example of, or can you maybe just lay out what that might look like? Immobility in the cities. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, I mean, if I take the example of um, people will, uh, will, uh, will need uh, to, instead of, of taking the subway to go uh, to their office and spending uh, half an hour, one hour uh, per, per day, uh, they will just go next door in a place where they have everything to work in good condition. But not staying alone in their apartment because they still need to to meet other people and to connect. That's what makes people uh, uh, enrich their 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 experience. Mm -hmm. So that's that's exactly exactly that. And it's not only through the hotel. We need more little bistro, more little restaurant, more boutique shop in order that people will find everything they need. But they will still need to travel. They will still need to meet the doctor or, or which is not maybe around where they're living, etc. So we, we still have traffic, but we promote immobility. And on top of that, it's, it's a, also another opportunity uh, that people will maybe escape the city and then only uh, 
uh, stay in the city for two days in order being able to meet their colleagues, work together, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and do what they need to do. Mm -hmm. And then they come back at home. So that's why there is a new hospitality or an increase of the, the hospitality, which is the extended stay. And uh, for us, I mean, the, the, the growth of extended stay since uh, 2070s is more than 20%. And that's will will be will uh, dramatically evolve uh, uh, again. And you know, with people traveling less now, are you guys thinking about anything in the you know more residential real estate space, building those sort of hubs uh, within cities right now uh, for people to more live in? So you know, sort of yeah. reversing where you guys have come from. Yeah, and that's that's why we've uh, already uh, launched. Uh, I mean, I think it's a few days ago a dedicated platform for that. Uh, a dedicated platform where we have uh, 50 50,000 apartments, villas, uh, really dedicated for extended stay. And that's that's a that's a real need today. And and we do that through uh, I think more than 15 brands uh, from uh, Raffles, uh, Fairmont, uh, Novotel. Uh, Adagio, or even uh, a one fine stay, which is the private rental. So villas, apartment, that's that's really a new demand. And that's why we, we have this uh, dedicated platform for it. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk a little bit around the design process and how you at a core and the brands that you've either acquired or built or have transformed, how some of those come to life and what, what it takes to build some of those services um, so again, you've acquired brands, you've transformed brands and built them on your own. Can you give examples of how those processes might look and how they might be different? For example, we always start, uh, when we work on, a, on an existing brand, for example, or even on a new, on a new brand, new experience, we, we always start by, uh, uh diving into, but why are we doing that? With the client, with the guest. So we really start always with, with a human. That's, that's the, 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 the first start. When we work on the, the new design philosophy for Novotel, for example, we reset everything. The evolution of the society is, is, is so huge that we just can't only change the decor of a Novotel in order to make the new Novotel. The Novotel need to answer the needs of the client of Novotel uh, today. And then we, uh, we do not uh, uh, define what we, what we want. We integrate the designer at the really beginning of that, uh, that reflection. And there is no boundaries. We choose the designers because of his, um, his eye, his, uh, his uh, let's say, uh, his, uh, his vision and uh, his capacity to, 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 to know uh, 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 and to identify the movement of the evolution of the society. Mm -hmm. And so for a, a brand like Novotel, we've worked simultaneously with uh, four designers, one in South America, one in, Tha in, uh, in, uh, in Thailand, uh, one in Russia, one in, uh, in Europe, and Together, we redefine completely the experience of Novotel, keeping the DNA, but changing everything. And that's very important. Creativity is really, uh, 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 really important in the process. If you want to innovate, you really need to be open. And we do not choose a designer with a hospitality designer, really the one who've got that vision of the evolution of the society. And that's, that's really key. And that's when we work uh, uh, for, let's say, to define the design strategy for a brand. For a project, a specific hotel, we also convince the owner to work with the best designer for, 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 his, for his project. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly the same process. And I like to say that it's a, it's a love story. It's a modern love story because the designer, the owner, and the brand all together, they need to fall in love. And when this magic happening, it makes great projects. Mm -hmm. Because a great designer, behind a great designer, or a great design, or a great hotel, there is always a great owner and a great brand, for sure. So you're talking about two very sort of differently-minded people, the very creative, 
optimistic outlook. Let's create something. And people who need to be very concerned, rightly so, about the bottom line and making sure that their business is sustainable. Do you find that that clashes? Do you find that, you know, you talked about this idea of they, they need to sort of fall in love with each other. Do you need to make that happen? Or is it something that happens more naturally? But sometimes it's natural, sometimes it's not. So, you know, uh, sometimes you, you, we all have conviction and very strong ideas. And uh, as, a, as a human people, it's, it's like that. And owners, sometimes they've, they've got their ideas. So we need to, to support each other in order really to open more doors, open more opportunity to increase the profitability. When I'm talking about creativity, I'm not saying that a designer is an artist. A designer is designing something in order to, 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 to make it profitable, uh, to be functional, profitable, and to create an experience and an emotion. We need to consider the designer as a real asset for the project. It's a value, a real added value. And so uh, uh, there is, a, let's say, a, an investment and a price to, 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 to pay for creativity. And that's, you know, people like uh, Apple, De Vialet, Heineken, Dyson, they understood that. They really invest a lot in design and creativity and, and they really make the difference with, with the competition. So in the hospitality world or in travel overall, do you think that there is a bigger role that a designer as a practice or however we want to define that term as a sort of work focus area, is that being recognized enough? Are those design leaders, creative leaders being brought in at the right time of the process or is there another way that we should be thinking about it? I must say that uh, it, it is just the beginning. So to, to be honest, I think um, uh, designer are really consider as a, as a real asset, uh, 20 20 percent so so it's a it's a very important uh, uh, role that that we have together uh, to to convince uh, to convince our our investors uh, that uh, that uh, designers are, are really key mm -hmm. and even if you know and it works because even if sometime um, we we have some some partners who, who have already selected the designers we said okay let's let's meet other people and, and they don't want at the beginning. And then after, they, okay, uh, agree just to meet a few, few other designers. And then after, they are very happy because they, they discover new things. And they realize that finally, the opportunity uh, for their project will be, uh, will be uh, even stronger. And how do you make those collaborations happen? I know... I'm not sure if you're still doing this or not, but you used to do a design day at a core where you guys would bring in different uh, different designers, different creatives, and business leaders as well. Um, are you still doing that, or what are some other ways that 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 sort of creative collaboration process comes to life? We are still we are still doing doing that, investing lots of time, and it starts with a design school, for example, that we organize, for example, a design contest, uh, international design contest with uh, with uh, the, 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 the schools. Because uh, it is true that we need to convince uh, investors to work with talented designers, but you also need to convince talented designers to work with investors. And uh, it's not uh, it's not like uh, like uh, buying a product. Uh, you, you know, lots of designers they do a project not because of the fees that they're going to get, but because of the ambition of the project. So that's very important. And for that, you need to invest a lot of time to 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 meet people, designers owners ex and, and explore and you need also to to demonstrate uh, the performance of the designer through different examples and not only taking uh, example in the hospitality but uh, in in different uh, in, in different business if you one day i, I invite uh, the, the head of uh, of uh, ubisoft for example explaining that they engage more than 200 designers in order to create a, a game. And it's, it's a much bigger investment than doing, a, than doing an hotel. And they said that uh, it's, very, um, it's crucial for the success of the, of the gaming because they are not designing a game, they are designing an emotion. And if the one who's playing that game gets an emotion, 
then it's going to work. And it's exactly the ambition, uh, the ambition uh, we have. Mm -hmm. And at Thales, which is a really different company, for example, you know, Thales, it's a company who produce a, a, a very technical uh, machines, for example, for the military, uh, uh, for the, the, uh, the boats, uh, plane, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And before it used to be 100% engineers. And now they start having more and more designers because they said that if there is a good design, then we don't need so much designers finally. We find better way and better solution. Right, and, and I think that's a really interesting point, that, that really intangible nature of designing an emotion, designing something that's invisible. Um, when most people, you know, and I think everyone, this is probably the, the easiest way to to think of what design is, is something that you can touch and feel, look at, looks pretty, uh, but really, you know, as, as you said, as we talked about at the start of this, that's about 20% of it. Yes. The other is so much more. And how do we, how do we encapsulate that in a way that it's more tangible? But it's, uh, it's, you know, that's, uh, that's why it's a very uh, specific, uh, let's say, uh, uh, job uh, designer, uh, because, uh, it's it's a it's a science in a way, uh, but uh, it's uh, very subjective. Uh, so so we try as much as possible to bring objectivity into subjectivity, but uh, it is very important. And you need to dare. And you know, lots of uh, uh, talented, and we, we can name it them as genius, for example, designers used to be seen as utopic. And when the future comes, then they say, oh no, it's incredible what they have invented 50, 30, 30, 50 years ago. If you take uh, the Eiffel Tower, for example, or the Pyramid du Louvre, and there is lots of examples like that. At that time, at their time, they were really considered as a really a mad, mad designers, utopic guys, etc. But with the acceleration of the evolution of the society, an utopic designer today is not an utopic. Is a visionary. Is some mm -hmm. someone that we really need, and quickly need, because the world is evolving so fast that the utopic of today are finally the designer of tomorrow. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's a really great point too, because you know, when you see that person that might have the crazy idea really ahead of their time, but then when you look back with the hindsight, you said, "Damn, could have used them in that situation," or "That was a great idea," or "That was." Yeah, you know, I'm sure you must run into that as well from from you know leading a course design function for the last 20 plus years. Um, I'm sure that's a conversation that you've had. Yeah, you know that there is two architects which I really love, uh, Mimeyer in Brazil or Le, Corbu Le Corbusier in uh, in France, and uh, they, they design uh, uh, more than 50 years ago uh, uh, building like if they were designing a vertical village. And people were saying, well, that's a very utopic project, etc." but they did it. Today, that's exactly what we are doing in the hospitality. Finally, an hotel is not an hotel anymore. It's a village where you can do everything. You can find good retails, shop, place to work, place to, 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 to eat, to, to live, etc., to meet people. And finally, we are creating now the hospitality of tomorrow. It's creating a village, and not 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 only a, a, an hotel, but to, tomorrow it will be a place with apartments, extended stay, co-living, hotels. It's going to be completely hybrid, and will be, uh, uh, I, I strongly believe, for our investors and for the needs of the people tomorrow. Uh, uh, the, the the next generation of the hospitality. Yeah, and I think maybe five years ago, maybe you guys were ahead of your time with work, life, and play and augmented hospitality, but man, that sped up and the time has met you now. Yeah, exactly. You know, with the Innovation Lab at Accor, we've worked with, on so many projects, new concepts inside the hotel or outside the hotel. and. And definitely, we were facing lots of difficulties because it was too early. And now, I should not say that because COVID is, is, is terrible, but, but the situation we are living accelerates everything. 
And finally, the time to market is now. So, so for designers, it's, uh, it's an incredible uh, period today because uh, uh, we thought that tomorrow uh, was in 20 or 30 years and finally tomorrow is today. And, 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 and that will be, uh, I think we're gonna have for the next five to 10 years, uh, uh, extraordinary uh, moment of, uh, of creativity and completely rede redesigning life in the city and finally really uh, um, uh, enhance the quality of life of people. And that's one of the main objectives of, of designers. You know, designers, they try to enhance quality of life, beauty, and, uh, and, and profitability because that's, that's, that's something very, very important also for them. Well, Damien, I think we're just about out of time. I was going to ask you, what do you feel optimistic about looking forward? But I, I think you might have just uh, nailed it in, that, in your last answer there. It sounds like you have a lot to look forward to on the yeah. time front. I'm very optimistic because, you know, um, I think there is, a, of course, travelers, uh, people, I mean, uh, for, for leisure, the travelers, I'm, I'm not afraid. People will travel because they want to discover the world, etc. For business, it will be maybe a bit different. But it will come back. It will come back. It will take maybe one year or two years, but it will come back. But then there is another opportunity of growth. It's all the, the, the people who are living around the hotel. And believe me, we have a lot to do. We've done a lot already. I think we are, we are, we are ready. But there is still a lot to do for them, and it will completely, uh, uh, I mean, change the profitability of the hospitality tomorrow and the quality of life of people. So I'm very optimistic for the future. Well, Damien, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Matt. It's a pleasure. All right. Be well. Thank you.
For our next session, we'll be taking a look at how diversity fuels creativity and innovation with Aaron Walton, founder and CEO of Walton Isaacson, in discussion with journalist and author Robert Rosenthal. Before we welcome Aaron and Rob to the stage, let's take a quick look at some of Aaron's work in action to set the scene. Lexus is making their most thrilling cars ever, but somehow people still see the brand as boring. We needed to change that by doing something truly exciting to connect with a new younger audience. Like partner with Marvel Studios' groundbreaking Black Panther film two years before its debut with a never-been-done-before content-generating experience. Exciting. We kicked it off by working with Deadpool creator Fabian Nicieza on an eight-part graphic novel, which Lexus launched at their exclusive first-ever Comic-Con concert with the Black Eyed Peas. Social media was lit. Fandom intensified when we had West Coast Customs create a one-of-a-kind Black Panther Lexus just in time for auto show season. And then we sponsored the Black Comic Book Festival. Excitement kept growing as we debuted Wakandan-inspired fashion from 10 up-and-coming designers at New York Fashion Week. Our influencer network spread the word every step of the way, creating anticipation for our next big moment, the launch of the new Lexus flagship on the Super Bowl, which was ranked one of the best commercials of the game, was the most watched Lexus commercial ever, and gave us a 1,080% lift in search at prominent auto sites. This unprecedented effort shattered all expectations. With over 56 million organic social media impressions, over 5 billion earned media impressions, and a 269% lift in Lexus LS sales. Show off. Proving that when you think beyond product placement and engage culture in an authentic way, the result is anything but boring. Well, how you like that? Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I will tell you that our guest uh, is the brains behind uh, incorporating Lexus into the um, Black Panther uh, movie franchise. He's the uh, founder and driving force behind uh, Walton Isaacson, the premier uh, multicultural marketing communications agency in America uh, with clients such as Lexus, as you've seen, and McDonald's. Uh, you might also be familiar with one of his partners in the business, Irvin Johnson, otherwise known as Magic. And uh, when he's not running the agency, which 
I mean, he's doing that 24-7, 365. But on the odd time that he takes a break, he can be found on runways in Paris and Milan, modeling the fashions of Japanese designer Rian Shu, making him literally the model businessman. <laughs> There's no one more equipped to talk about the power of diversity on. So on behalf of Skift, I am delighted to introduce you to uh, Aaron Walton. Hello, Aaron. Hello. Thank you for that incredible introduction. Very generous. Thank you, Rob. Well, you know, uh, not generous, uh, honest, uh, uh, true. Okay, so let's jump uh, right to it in the time that we have. Our topic today is uh, uh, diversity, uh, how it fuels uh, creativity and innovation, it, it, whether it's in advertising, uh, in the workplace, uh, in the marketplace, everywhere. What does it mean? What does that mean to you? Uh, so... Here, here's what diversity means to me. It, it really means harnessing the power of disruption, right? Because differences are disruptive. And, and that's the key to innovation, disrupting the status quo or, or the predictable. And when we have, you know, when we have moments of disruption, it kind of breaks those patterns that often lead to blind spots. And so what it really means for me it is really uh, being disruptive. You know, at our agency, we don't refer to DNI in the traditional sense of uh, diversity and inclusion. We think of it as um, disruption and innovation, and and that's kind of ultimately the the power that it has. What does it uh, What does it look like when it's working? Well, it, it looks and sounds messy. If I'm going to be honest with you, you know, on the surface, it looks you know, racially diverse, like a full spectrum of skin colors, hairstyles, clothing choices, cultural cues. Uh, the eye should actually be able to see diversity, but just as important, or probably even more important is, is how it sounds, right? The ear should be able to pick up diversity because conversations should be colliding with different points of view, different life experiences, different ways of, of looking and solving problems. So the sound of diversity is the sound of like, how do I say, it? it's a sound of the status quo kind of smashing into pieces and then rearranging them into something that no one had come up with before. You know, when I talk about it, I often use the analogy of a, of a kaleidoscope, right? When you look at a kaleidoscope, there are these beautiful individual shapes and colors and, and, and on its own, each of those could be beautiful. It is beautiful, but when you kind of turn it and twist it, you create something even more dynamic and more um, uh, kind of graphic and, and just more engaging. And so for, for me, it's really about those collisions and how it can, can uh, help move things forward. And how, will, how and why is that particularly important in a creative business? That's a great question. Uh, look, you've done stand-up, right? Yeah. So, so you know often that the first jokes that you discover are not necessarily, well, they, they're likely to be the same jokes as another comic will discover. And the obvious always comes first, whether it's in comedy or any creative, you know, expression. But breakthrough creativity, that's way down there. It, it has to be kind of excavated and, and shaped and molded and twisted and when you do that, you know, in a creative business, you know, it can it will survive, it will thrive by having that kind of competitive edge, by discovering those gems, those moments of innovation that no one else ever saw. We can all basically create, we can all play the game, but innovation, game changing. That's what happens when you understand, you know, how to activate diversity. And, and by the way, it, it has an impact on the bottom line, right? M McKinsey did a study um, and they showed that, you know, gender diverse companies were 15% more likely to outperform their competitors. And they found that, you know, ethnically diverse companies were likely to outperform the companies by 35%. Right. It, so, so it does have a, a huge, huge impact. Uh, on the bottom line, Harvard Business uh, did Harvard Business Review did a study too. They showed that leaders who give diverse voices, you know, equal airtime, are two and a half times um, more likely to unleash value-driving insights. And and 
when they create this kind of speak up uh, culture, they found that the employees are three and a half times more likely to unleash their full innovative potential. So it really does play a role in creativity. It plays a role uh, in how people feel and, and it plays a role in the, in the profitability of a company. Yes, uh, I was going to ask you about it, and uh, that's it. It's empirical data that uh, suggests both, uh, not, not even suggests, but actually proves out that both uh, creativity and diversity are a competitive uh, advantage, provide competitive advantage. Um, so let's let's segue into uh, travel, since uh, the audience here uh, is in the, uh, in the travel industry. W one would think, uh, Aaron, that diversity is kind of inherent in a global business that's essentially about experiencing, uh, you, you know, different cultures. Yeah. Uh, so as someone who has, uh, you, you know, traveled extensively yourself, do you see sufficient diversity reflected in the industry's approach? Here's what I would say. You know, one of the great joys of travel is to change the view and to experience something new to you, right? But that can't fully happen if you don't have a different lens. And that's not a camera lens I'm talking about. You know, it, it's it's you, it's your eyes, it's your brain. You need to open, you know, open up to how you perceive the world around you and not judge it, just, just absorb it. Uh, travel's all about storytelling. But but who is telling the stories and what stories are, are they telling? Without diversity, travelers keep seeing the same history that reflects you know, dominant cultures, but there are infinite numbers of stories to be told, sights to be seen. It's why we're, you know, seeing statues being torn down around the world. People are tired of the same old narratives told by the same old storytellers. So, uh, you know, I, I do think that there is a place and, a, and an important place for diver that diversity an important role that diversity plays in, in the travel industry. Do you see some uh, opportunities in travel? Oh, I mean, 100% uh, from the way travel is experienced to, you know, and are marketed to the way trips are experienced once the travel arrives. For example, you know, I'm a, a, a black gay man and, and I want to know that my travel experience is going to be relevant and respectful to, to my values. But I also know it's not just about, you know, matching my identity for my sake. I, I can't tell you. You know, how many allies, white allies, straight allies, people who don't have my background at all want to know that their travel choices are going to be, uh, you know, represent the world that really exists. And even a future forward world that's being created, not some kind of outdated version of it. So, yeah, so it does play a role. Uh, you know, I spent... Uh, 25 years in the international uh, advertising business, and I would say that uh, even though I haven't uh, uh, been there for a little while, uh, the industry, the advertising industry, was never particularly adept at uh, at, at diversity, and maybe there have, maybe there's been some improvement. So, what does it take really to to bring about change? What what is the what is the fear that's blocking uh, kind of uh, the change when you consider the obvious? positive impact of, of actually bringing different voices to the table? That's a great question. Um, uh, the fears is change, right? People say that they embrace change, but that's often not what's going on emotionally. They embrace change if they don't have to give up anything. Yeah. But, but with diversity, there's a perception that change means losing something, fear of losing power, control, you know, dominance. It's a scarcity mentality based on hundreds, you know, of years of dominant culture and gender. But but let's face it, white males have been running the show, right? Not just and not just in the U.S. And change is hard, but change is inevitable. So so rather than framing it as you know, things that are, are, we're going to lose, it's essential to have what I call this kind of like this courage to collide because there's upside to what seems scary and messy. There's an understanding that change brings benefits, gains, not losses. And, and, and that more, the more open you are, you know, and the more you open yourself up to change, the more you want to keep expanding. 
Yeah, I feel like the way that I have heard you express it is that there's a fear that by bringing new parties into the uh, into the equation that somehow it's uh, you have to give up. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Um, I'm going to say that you haven't, uh, that you can't. Uh, Sorry, am I having some audio. Oh, all right. I'm. Uh, I'm going to. Oh, there you go. Uh, You're, back. You're back. Okay, fine. I was just saying that I think when we talk about fear, I I feel like I've heard you express the idea that you, you know the fear is that you bring more people into the equation and somehow it uh, it, it shrinks the the pie. In, instead, what it is that you're saying is, in fact, bringing new people into the equation actually expands the total pie. It expands the pie, right? It, it's it's not about making it less for one group. It's about being more relevant and expanding the opportunity for other people to participate and to enjoy the benefits of the brand or the company. And uh, so the pie actually doesn't get smaller. It actually gets it gets bigger. As a communications professional, let me ask you this question, because I can imagine people uh, in the audience, especially those who are in marketing and communication and running businesses. One of the questions that I, I, I would I would ponder is when we talk about diverse uh, audiences, uh, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a black, uh, African-American, LGBT, uh, Hispanic, uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, are, are, are different or unique campaigns uh, to reach those people uh, uh, required uh, for different audiences? Or is there a more kind of uniform way of addressing the, the, the total audience? What, what's your take on that? Uh, so yes and no. Right, required is kind of a loaded word. It's kind of like you know, taking medicine. We should want to create work for different audiences uh, to be relevant, to be as relevant as possible. Uh, what's required is an incredible connection. Uh, the, the the path to connection comes from in many different forms, right? But yes, one size does not fit all. So that I believe to be truth. I also believe that there are universal truths that do exist. So certainly there's work that appeals to diverse groups at the same time. But even being universal is often a result of being specific and understanding what's unique about that segment, right? So it, so the answer is, I guess, you know, yes and no to some degree. You've spoken uh, before about creating kind of a positive creative tension. Uh, so let me ask you this. W you, where do you find inspiration? And uh, on that note, uh, tell, tell the people about Bayard uh, Rustin. Yes, yes, Bayard. Well, um, okay, so for the first part, I would say that inspiration is all around us. You know, you just have to be receptive to it, to be curious. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm curious. I want to discover things and 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 learn about new things, and then try to come up with unique solutions. Right. Um, I think you have to get out of your comfort zone, and and I'm always to to your point about Bayard. I'm I'm always inspired by the words of Bayard Russell. And, and for those folks who aren't familiar with Bayard, um, he's considered the lost prophet of the civil rights movement. He was actually um, the person who came up with the idea for the March in Washington, which is where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous uh, I Have a Dream speech. And one of the things that Bayard said was that um, what every community needs is a group of angelic troublemakers. Mm -hmm. right? And, and that message really inspired me uh, and is kind of the basis in part for what our agency does. We, we refer to ourselves as enlightened rebels, right? So we've, we've taken the inspiration of Bayard's angelic troublemakers and, and then kind of incorporated that into how we approach uh, our own agency, how we approach our client's business, which is you know data-driven, looking at insights, uh, but understanding that those insights come from a, a lot of different groups and, and really trying to change the status quo, um, which as I said earlier, kind of leads to those blind spots and ultimately gives you the level of innovation that that you need well i mean at minimum you've given me fodder for the next time i introduce you because apparently <laughs> you're a rebel and a troublemaker really yeah. i've been told i'm a troublemaker hopefully in a, in a good way um, well uh, it, it appears that you are now let me let me do something here uh in in the uh, time that we have left uh 
in a positive way. I mean, obviously, we live in a country at this moment that's very divided uh, in, in, in many ways. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of uh, uh, tension and, 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 and racial rhetoric and, and et cetera, et cetera, uh, and, and a demand for reform and, an un and, and a lot of discussion uh, around systemic uh, racism. But I want to focus on, on the positive aspect yeah. of that, which is to say that that is going to maybe accelerate or amplify in some ways some some positive change. So let's we can look at it we can look at it in terms of I can I can leave it up to you to talk about inclusion or authenticity, but I can also ask you this: when it comes to kind of like the next generation of of, of creative leaders or even leaders in the travel business, what do you how do you see them kind of tackling uh, the, the 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 challenge of inclusivity? So that's a great question. Uh, so look, I, I see the next generation of creative business leaders coming from historically marginalized groups, right? And therefore not viewing inclusivity as a challenge, but more of a responsibility, right? A natural way of being, you know, all this lack you know, of inclusivity isn't rocket science. It's a choice to exclude people. But the next generation knows that it's a terrible choice. And, and they're going to make better choices and we'll all be better for it, I, 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 one would hope. You know, one of our mutual friends, Ro Rochelle Newman Carrasco, who's a brilliant writer and, and uh, Hispanic strategist. And I remember her being in a meeting one time and one of the, uh, the clients had said, well, you know, you know, Rochelle, millennials are colorblind. And so they don't see color. So it's, it's fine to kind of do this kind of total market. And, and she said, well, wait a minute. But when is being blind a good thing? Actually, millennials are color comf confident. They see color, they understand it, they celebrate it, and they can't understand anyone who doesn't. And so I see that generation, those people looking at this as their responsibility and not as a chore uh, for something that they have to do in the future. Is there a way to, to approach uh, uh, marketing and communications uh, uh, that maybe I, maybe you've answered this, but I, I'm, I'm, um, we have the time. So, I mean, is there a way to approach marketing and advertising in a way that uh, that's more inclusive? If by we you mean gatekeepers, you know, the people holding on to power, which is fundamentally, quite frankly, straight white males and, and white women after that, you acknowledge the reality that you prioritize inclusivity as a business goal uh, that is real and measurable and requires you to, to change how you do things. Uh, it, required, it requires you to kind of learn and listen and to put your faith in the people who know inclusivity better than you do, right? And you understand that inclusivity isn't just about adding people or extending invitations for people to participate. It's giving people leadership, power, budgets, authority in supporting them in the process. It's yeah. not just about checking the boxes. It's about giving them a seat at the table and a voice at the table and the responsibility that, that comes with it. By the way, on a completely uh, unrelated note, I mean, it's clear that I'm coming to you from New York City. I don't know if you can hear it, but generally we have police and ambulance uh, sirens in the background. Yeah, sadly, uh, things are taking a turn for the worse with COVID, but- um, well, well, yeah. We'll get it, get it um, Yeah, uh, let, me, uh, let me ask you this. What about you, you what, what is authenticity? You talk a lot about kind of uh, ensuring authenticity. And I, I understand it in the context of this conversation because yeah. anybody can kind of, like you said, you know, fill in boxes. I have this, I have this, I have this, but this, what, what, what people are able always, I think consumers are always able to perceive is that it's coming to them in a way that feels you, you know, legit, authentic, real. What's what's your commentary on that? Well, first, it will be authentic, authentic when uh, people engaged are from diverse communities, right? Engaged in leadership positions, not just engaged as consultants. Um, and it will be authentic when people's intentions are adjusted to really care about diverse consumers as people, not just the statistics or stereotypes or as business opportunities, but as people with cultural histories and names that need to be pronounced properly and heritage stories that need to be relearned and celebrated, not just, you know, one month of the year. I tell folks all the time, look, I'm glad you're celebrating Black history. I'm glad you're celebrating, you know, Gay Pride Month, but 
I'm black and gay 365 days a year <laughs> in, in June. I like talk yeah. all the time. Right? Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Um, you know, uh, b- before we uh, close up, just uh, on kind of more of a personal thing, I got to say that the year leading into the um, in, into the into the kind of lockdown, I. I had never been to more places in my life. I mean, I was literally uh, uh, in, in 15 countries. And, and I, you, you know, I mean, we, you know, we, come, we're, we all, we come from kind of a traveled mentality. We, we just love the energy of being in another place and, 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 and really kind of absorbing uh, uh, the local culture. So I'm at the point now where literally, uh, you know, I get a car ride and go to Connecticut and I'm excited. You know what I'm saying? It's like, <laughs> what are you on a personal level? What do you, like, wh- like when we can get back uh, uh, and, and travel, like what's, what are you looking forward to most? Is it a, is it a vacation thing? Is it a business thing? What's your, what are you excited about? I, I will tell you, honestly, it is about connecting with friends that I haven't been able to yeah. uh, see. Uh, you know, I have an apartment in New York. I'm in Los Angeles now. Um, and I, I was thinking the other day, this is the longest in my career. And I've, I've been at this now since 1983, right? Mm-hmm. This is the longest in my career I've never been in New York for any stretch of time. So I'm looking forward to being able to get back to New York. Um, I literally haven't been on a plane, sadly, since March. And and I'm like you, you know, I was on the road 80% of the time. I loved it. There was an energy when I was on, you know, when I would travel, I would see the same people at the airport and they became as much and as close to me as some of my staff, right? I, I usually travel American, United, and an American, you know, those folks were were connected to me in, in, in a very, special way. So I kind of miss that. I, I love theater. I love the art and I can't wait for Broadway to be back up so I can, you know, I can go back and enjoy the amazing uh, artistry that, that's out there. Hey, uh, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but uh, just how many frequent flyer miles do you happen to have these days? Oh my God. Well, I, I was, I was really nervous because, uh, you know, I'm concierge key in, with American yeah, and and all of a sudden, the first thing that happened, I was like, "Oh my God, am I going to lose my status?" <laughs> <laughs> it's a real issue. But, um, I, I have no idea anymore. I stopped yeah. running. I, you know, I think career miles. I must be 13, 14. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, uh, enough to 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 mention uh, concierge key because that really that's the the key right there. Um, and then uh, you you know finally, I, I mean, uh, uh, the courage to collide. It seems to me that if I have a takeaway, basically, yeah. It's about that. It's the it's the courage to collide, meaning, you, you know, to embrace uh, diverse uh, perspectives, point of view, uh, people, uh, uh, religion, color, whatever it is, because uh, whether you look at it from a common sense perspective or the empirical data that you, oh, that is my uh, timer, the, the empirical uh, data that you mentioned earlier, it's a win-win. There's just, there's no downside to doing this thing the right day, right way. Uh, your closing thoughts, my friend. I, I could not agree with you more. Uh, you know, I really believe that the courage to collide is how we move things forward, how we get innovation. We have to also acknowledge that we're human beings and that sometimes stepping out of our comfort zone is, it is challenging. Uh, but let's acknowledge that it's challenging. Let's face that fear with an understanding that when we do it, when we get to that other side, when we sit and open ourselves up to these incredibly brilliant and supportive people that don't necessarily look like us, but have a point of view and have lived a different life experience, that it is going to be better for everybody. We're going to make the pie bigger, not smaller. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm encouraged. I, I see a lot of people reaching out to us now, uh, starting to understand why that's important. Um, you know, it's sad that, that it took a tragedy sometimes to kind of shake people up, but it did. And so let's let's use that to kind of learn and to move forward. And, and to do the right things and do the things that are going to help our businesses. Yeah, as they say, never waste a, a crisis. Uh, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, there you have it. He's a troublemaker. He is a rebel. Uh, he is the one and only uh, Aaron Walton. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for your time and your insights. Always a pleasure to be with you. Well, Rob, anytime I get to talk to you, it's a pleasure. Thank you. And thank come, you, Skip. Come to, come to New York City. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. Me too.
cap off today's event, we'll be exploring what it means to collaborate and build community in the digital world with Marcus Schreier, SVP of the Americas and Innovation at Design Hotels, and Leilani Franklin Apted, Chief Design Officer and Head of Experiences at Unsettled. Together, they took home the Skift Idea Award for Virtual for Virtual Partnership Partnership Virtual Retreat four-week journey of interactive learning, personal growth, and creative experiences for hoteliers and travel advisors. They were kind enough to put together some behind-the-scenes clips of the experience to give us a sense of what that journey looked like, illustrating how we can connect in a meaningful way during these remote and isolated times. I will shout out that this is not a typical brand sizzle reel, but an honest, authentic look at how this experience came to life. We're excited to share it with you. Let's take a look. We put this together as a way to try to drive some form of connection and try to chart a, a path together uh, as a way to look at where the future is going. But we felt it was as important to try to have some sort of um, learning and self-development piece. What is it that inspired you to join this journey? Vision for the world and for humanity. feeling into your heart. And now we're going to do a little bit of freestyle. Good. Moving in your body. Can I shoot her well? Yes. Okay, perfect. But this is a shift in a trend about self-enlightenment, about journey, about learning, discovery, and determining future life paths. New focuses on recuperation, restorative values, and ways that we can recalibrate our systems. When is the last time you tried something new? What is the human experience? What is what is the path of our life? What are the things that matter to us? I feel like we have a responsibility as a community to put our intentions to work. That we need your help uh, in the marketplace to try to figure out the best way to communicate this to the traveling world. Touched on so many things that have made up the past month of connection that we've built, the importance of these chromatic mindsets, and really you posed a great question to us, what does that mean for the future and how are we going to come together to co-create the extraordinary? Leilani, Marcus, welcome. Hi, it's great to be here. Good to see you all. Thanks great to have you guys too. You know, admittedly, when I was recording that introduction last night, I was feeling very zen. But after that last session, I'm feeling a bit amped up now. And just looking at all the people dancing on Zoom meetings, what exactly are we looking at? And how do I get my Zoom meetings to be more fun like that? I mean, it's interesting. Like we, we really wanted with this experience to um, get everyone a little bit out of their chairs. Uh, you know, we're all in this in this fatigue in this lockdown, right? And, and it was about getting the travel advisors jumping up. You know, breeze, giving them new tools. Uh, you know, make them positive about what's ahead of us. Uh, where we're all kind of in this in this crisis mode. Um, yeah, and that was that was the that was the refreshing thing to see. It's all even possible over over a virtual component, right? Yeah, so that's I think you're looking. Weeks. Sorry, Leilani. Sorry, no, I was just going to say, I think you're looking at uh, humans being human, even if we're experiencing it through a screen, you know, in their spaces, feeling their bodies moving around and kind of blurring that line between digital and physical. I know it's such a strange thing, you know, even today, as we're doing all these talks and all these discussions, uh, it'd be so great if we could be together and, and figure out some way to, uh, you know, invoke that spirit of fun in, in a way that we don't typically get every day or most days now. So I'd like to just hear a little bit about, you know, what was this four week virtual retreat journey that you put people on? What was the impetus behind it? Um, and how did it shake out all in all? Yes, um, um, I think for, for other design hotels, we're seeing ourselves as 
as visionaries in the hospitality space, we always looked in the journey and given an experience, right? So when you look at our further series, which was about or is about transformation of a space of people, I think that's very important. And that's why we were looking into a curriculum from the beginning. Um, and we, we introduced a study uh, last year uh, together with the Future Laboratory, and you saw Chris Sanderson and and Martin Raymond uh, in in this in this quick video, and we were talking about what is the travel of future um, twenty thirty, what are the travelers looking for, and what we call the travel. And, and COVID nineteen was an accelerator of this movement, where we talked about conscious travel, where we talked about sustainability, where we talked about drive through markets, right? And when we couple of months ago, sit down together and we were looking at the industry where we're all in the lockdown and our travel advisors, our travel professionals around the world, we're in a stage of kind of reassessing what are we selling in the future? What is the, the travel of wants? Uh, how are we getting out of this crisis? Um, that was kind of what brought us to the idea of taking them through a curriculum, through a journey, right? And and we had a conversation with Unsettled and Lala and the team for, for a while, talking more on the physical side and, and bringing experience to our hotels. But we thought it's a, it's a perfect opportunity um, where we always look at innovation, bring one and one equals three, bring two partners together and make something unique, which brings hope and passion into the travel industry again. Um, and yeah, as we said, get everyone uh, away from their from their chairs and, and breathe. Uh, but Lala, you, you have probably a couple of things to share to this process as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think we, we kind of approach this as thinking, you know, and Subtle comes at this from an experiential lens. And we were thinking we're all having experiences now. So how do we make those intentional about the things that we really care about? And so, you know, working with, with Marcus and the Design Hotels team, we just took this really co-created approach to building an experience and a, and a journey where we were all having it in our own physical spaces, but we had this shared experience to go through together. And I think, you know, we found a, a lot of alignment between Design Hotels and their concept of the this promatic traveler of the future. And then us at Unsettled, uh, we took a look at it and we said, gosh, we've essentially been promatic travelers in a promatic community from day one. So we had this shared set of beliefs and values uh, to build off of. And I think that provided a really great platform for, for creating a, a journey together. Right. And, you know, I think right now a lot of people are adapting to this new environment. But Leilani, this is something you've been doing for a while. And I'd love for you to just give a little background about what Unsettled is. And I should also point out to people that her background looks great right now, but she's calling in from Thailand where it's 2 a.m. And I just want to say thank you again for that, by the way. Thank you. We're, we're well into Friday over here, but anyone that knows me knows that I am such a night owl. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, yeah, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, Unsettled and kind of what we brought to us to this, you know, we are a, a global community. Um, and a kind of experience design and retreat uh, company. And we were founded in this very lofty idea that, you know, we have this lifelong pursuit of growth, meaning and adventure, which basically means we get to explore the world and play around with the boundaries between life and work and all of these things uh, and to do it in a shared context and, and to really see what kind of just what happens when we kind of combine our powers and try to redefine what what life can offer us. And so we, we've honed our design skills, you know, mostly over in-person retreats, um, hundreds of retreats across more than 20 countries. And in, in the middle of last year, pre-COVID, we ha asked ourselves this question of how can we unsettle anyone at any point, even if they can't travel? So how do we actually speak to that stationary person? And that led us to, to exploring this concept of virtual retreats. Uh, and luckily it was, it was just in time. And when we combine that with you know, Marcus's extreme desire to, to experiment and kind of be a visionary for travel, uh, we were able to, to really put something together where we had a lot of alignment. Yeah. So you chose to live that unsettled life. Many of us are unsettled just from the circumstances of the world right now. What we saw in that video, you saw people reflecting, doing meditation, you saw them dancing, you saw them sharing uh, with colleagues, with 35 people that they didn't really know at the start, I'm sure, maybe, maybe some did. Um, but 
talk to me a little bit about that, uh, how you get people to experiment that way, how you get them to be vulnerable and open to these kinds of experiences, especially now that we're all working in this way and need to find new ways to connect. I, I was just thinking it's funny. I never saw Lala in a different setting than in the middle of the night. So uh, uh, she's really, she's really walking it. Um, I'm, I'm actually at the at the Crosby Street Hotel in New York. Uh, hotel is open, vibrant. So I think you're all the good news that that's good for the industry. No, you have a valid point, Matt. Uh, it it was certainly an experiment about are we getting uh, people around the world engaged in a four week concept, right? Um, and I think we're all in, in this kind of Zoom fatigue and, and we didn't want to make it a couple of sessions. We wanted to make a, a curriculum, a journey. Uh, people can self-reflect, they can learn, they can de develop, right? And um, what we saw is it, it, we kept it as the philosophy. We didn't put an expectation on top of people of what's coming out of it. It was about co-creation. Uh, we wanted to make everyone part of the journey uh, let's co-create on the future of travel. Um, let's uh, go through various kind of formats to open up. And, and one thing, uh, what was really, I think two weeks in the, into that journey, we had a, we had a breathworking session where we asked everyone to come up with a, uh, you know, in a comfortable way, bring a towel, you know, like in, and use your couch and cameras open. And it was like, it was very vulnerable. Like you said, it was a very personal setting. And we went through this two-hour breastwork session, uh, opening up, and and I think that made it so unique, so emotional, uh, which opened my eyes in my perspective, where sometimes even on the physical events, we fall short in really connecting with people in a very personal way. And we were able to do this on a virtual um, layer, which I think is is very good news for us as, a, as an industry, right, in traveling hospitality. Mm -hmm. Were you worried at all around the, you know, four weeks sounds pretty daunting. I know it was sort of chopped up into a couple hours here, a couple hours there. Uh, were you worried at all about that time commitment that you were asking from people? Yeah, uh, it was a big ask. <laughs> it was a big ask, it's true. Um, you know, I think that we have had some unique uh, opportunities now, you know, to the question about vulnerability, we're all having such intense and magnified emotional experiences that we almost need to be vulnerable. We need to share that layer of depth because of how heavy and how intense things are. And I think to, to speak into that, you know, we needed that slower pace in a way. We needed time to let things unfold, to digest, to process. So, uh, you know, at the beginning, it felt like a big ask. I think by the end, Marcus, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but people were like, can we have four more weeks? Can we have more time? You know, it becomes both routine and also something that you see there's just so much more that we can explore together. Mm -hmm. And Marcus, when it comes to travel and hospitality, do you see do you see an opportunity for either virtual or hybrid experiences um, as a new and different path forward? Or is this really just more of a band-aid solution as travel has sort of ceased this year yeah no that that that's a question uh, um i get asked a lot is is this something getting out of COVID 19 and the pandemic and then we back into the the normal um i think all brands and travel and hospitality who uh, have a focus on creation and want to give a very unique experience i think we all were kind of thinking about how we get this across into into the the world and and when we did uh, just an example where we did further Marfa last year where we uh, brought a really meaningful story and we collaborated with artists in in Marfa Texas it was not about bringing hundreds of people into the destination to have a party or something it was about taking the philosophy of this travel experience and bring it into the world that's why we created a lot of content but what was a really pleasant surprise uh, I think that we're seeing a layer also on the, in the virtual um, component. I think there's a moving forward, there's a, the virtual experience will almost complement the physical experience where we're able as travel and hospitality industry to connect with the community, to build touch points, um, to uh, learn, to collaborate, to co-create, and then move, shift also into the physical experience, right? So I think from a from a strategy standpoint, from a business model standpoint, uh, virtual uh, will will have a lot of components. Let's not make the mistake to, I think always when we think virtual, we think about technology. And yes, we have to 
yeah, probably better technology, especially when we when we talk about experience with music and artists and so on. But it's it's even in the virtual space, it's about a human touch point, a human connection, and I think that made also this experience so strong. Yeah, I really love this question too because. You know, I think that as we start to renegotiate the ratio of hybrid, you know, virtual to physical space, that there's actually so much in the future, so much going forward for us to explore. To me, this idea that it's like either 100% physical or 100% digital is such a fallacy because even when I'm connecting with you digitally, I'm in a physical space, you're in a physical space, there's still that component to play around with. And when I'm in a physical space, more often than not, even if we were together, we'd probably be interacting with some tech, with some digital ways, whether it's our devices in our pockets or, or tech in our spaces. So there's, it's not just 100% here or there, there's all these different ratios that we can play with going forward, all these grays in between to build out that I think is really exciting. Yeah, you know, and one of, the, one of the terms you guys keep mentioning is co-creating. As a brand, Marcus, is it difficult to let either the audience or let partners create something that's on your behalf? I mean, wh what does that balance look like between the, the DNA of the hotel brand versus the partners versus the audience? Uh, are there restrictions that are good or like, you know, sort of guidelines that are put in place? How does that work? Um, I think when you, when you look at the pandemic and COVID-19, um, it's, it's such an example where I believe, or, or you, when you look what's happening is everyone is fighting for their own sake, right? You see every government, every hospital even is, is kind of trying to get out of this, right? And I think we as an industry have to co-create, collaborate, and, and not even within our own um, industry as hospitality travel. I think there's a lot of opportunities out there. Uh, and I think the consumer wants us to co-create and come up with with interesting experiences. Does it mean that everything is perfect? Um, everything is polished? Have we have seen it in the past? Probably not, because it's a, it's a different environment we're operating in. Mm -hmm. And but also, what's also interesting is I think the consumer, in a way, is seeking for this more. And I don't want to use the word authentic because it's such a buzzword, but have an honest, raw experience. Right? They want to be part of this journey. They want to co-create. They, they want to learn. They want to give something back. They want to take something from the trip and 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 in their in their in their life, right? So I think uh, we as brands have a huge opportunity there. It's not about just putting a statement on a website. I think we have to co-create. We have to really uh, mean it and 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 walk the talk. And uh, I think we will see this more and more. And 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 it came out of a, a need because obviously budgets are not there right now and. And no one knows where this is going. Um, and uh, but I think that's something we're taking to the new normal. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there is a huge need, and you know, that that willingness to experiment and to do something that that might be a little bit more raw uh, and not so highly polished, not so you know, not so many strict, stringent guidelines around it. Because I think there's a lot of innovation from a very grassroots level that can come and help both, you know our travelers and the people that we're talking to in our communities, but also us as, as businesses to be able to take some of those insights and figure out what's next, either more of this or how do we adapt and build off of some of the, some of the successes. So it builds into something better in the future. There's actually a, a, a like something polish is actually really limited. It's done. It's finished. There's nowhere to go with it. You can consume it passively, but there's no opportunity. So this idea that we can leave things raw or unfinished and that that gives space for people to input their ideas, their thoughts, to, to own it, to produce it with you. To me, that's actually, there's more possibility in that than in this final polished thing, um, even though it's a little counterintuitive to how we normally think about things. Oh, well, that's I, I'm absolutely thinking that way. What you've probably seen today, if you've logged onto the event, is we've been trying out a whole ton of different things. We'll see what works, what doesn't, but we'll definitely learn from it. And, uh, you know, interesting times ahead, whether as we're creating things or as we're making business decisions, I think, you know, again, just that willingness to experiment um, and bring people around ideas, which is actually another uh, topic I want to get into. So now that we don't have a physical location in which this retreat was happening, you guys were really bringing people around philosophies, ideas, and themes. And I want to pull up real quick, just an image of some of the themes that you had, well, I, I guess week by week, the, the four themes. 
And what was the sort of deciding factor for what these looked like and how are they different from one another? Well, I'd love to, to mention here that, you know, one of our core aims and non-negotiable for us was that this had to be experiential. You know, it had to be intentional. It had to be um, kind of co-created and done together, but it had to be experienced. So it wasn't about telling people, it was about letting them try it on, experience it for themselves and having them tell us what it was about. And so these themes came out of the, the Promatic report that Design Hotels put together. And it was thinking about what are the mindsets, the attitudes and the values of this future traveler and how can we as a community, as participants in this retreat, actually try those on for ourselves. So these were our guiding themes that really let us try on the mindsets of this future traveler to be them rather than be told about them. And I think that kind of guided our, our content, our co-creation, what we focused on each week so that, you know, it wasn't just an endless field of possibility, it was really kind of focused on that shared experience. Do you, either of you have a favorite theme of those weeks? Tough question. Marcus, do you have one? Uh, I think, I mean, I mean, I always passion for purpose. Um, um, and it, that's something we we were focusing a lot. We, we brought purpose brought in uh, Rock House Foundation. I think Paul Salman is is joining us today, Nicholas Conda from the Aspire School in the Philippines. Uh, some of our member hotels who really are transforming communities, and we're, I think we as a travel industry can learn a lot. I think that's something what was very were very emotional parts of the, the program. But one thing I learned also, and it goes a little bit in this in this raw thought you brought up, uh, Matt. We didn't show any presentation, uh, and and I know we in hospitality we love pictures from our hotels. We want to show them. We could like to click through presentations. We we didn't do any of that, and really focused on the human touch point and the conversation. And I remember we had Carlos Cudier joining us from Grupo Habitat, speaking about the new space you're creating in Mexico City. We didn't show anything. People on the way find their find their way in the internet, look at the space. But we were really focusing on what Carlos has to say and what's the philosophy of the of the, the experience they want to create, right? And and often we forget that even in the physical events where we're going through a you know we're looking at a presentation, we're looking at a at a at a PowerPoint, and we're losing on the on the essence of what makes travel and hospitality so strong, right? And and I think that was something which was fascinating. I think we banned the word amenities, didn't we, Marcus? Which is quite a tricky thing to do when you're literally talking about, you know, fantastically well-equipped hotels. Um, for, for me, the, the theme that kind of resonated with me a lot, I think given the time we were running it, was actually personalized and rare. Uh, this is quite a feature of, of Design Hotels properties. It's something that resonates with us as Unsettled that we're each on this unique journey, bringing unique experience. But I love this idea that we can find uh, spaces to come together that allow for our differences. And with everything that was going on globally, globally around uh, diversity, inclusion, Black Lives Matter, all these things, it was wonderful to find a way to celebrate uh, what makes us personalized and rare, but in a way that brought us together instead of separated us. So I, I really liked that theme. I love that. And that was obviously a, a four week journey. Uh, we're talking about building online community, building connections. Is there an ongoing journey aspect to this? What happens after the four week end? Does the journey continue in any way? We, we have a few touch points moving forward. So um, I think it's one thing we, we're doing is in the next virtual retreat, the participants who went through the journey uh, uh, will nominate the next travel advisors going through it and, uh, and a few others. I think what's more important is uh, we created this, this sense of belonging. It, we created this community who is attached to the way we see travel and hospitality moving forward. Um, and, um, and Jonathan, one of the co-founders of Unsettled, said it the other day, um, when you look at Burning Man for it, there's so many Burning Man events going after Burning Man. Even Burning Man is not involved in that, right? Um, but there is this community growing. And I think that's something we're seeing already in a, and, and what we um, uh, will encourage and then obviously see, can we have other partners joining and, and, and involving that story? Yeah, there wasn't really an end. It didn't feel like an end. Uh, you know, maybe there weren't stuff regularly scheduled things being dropped in your calendar, but 
we it felt like we had started something rather than ended it. And we made a very big point um, in our quote unquote closing session to remind people that this has always been about co-creation and that they now owned this space with us, owned the community and even owned those promatic mindsets. And that it was up to us how we wanted to share and continue and grow that. And I think that, yeah, we felt really excited about it. it we ended on, on quite a high. Well, speaking of ending on quite a high, we are about to wrap up here. Um, I, I will say just, just on that last point, one of the, as, as we were doing some prep work for this session, one of the quotes one of you said was, if you build it, they will come, but if they build it, they will stay. And I think that is just a, you know, just a great thing to keep in mind in terms of when we're talking about co-creating community and that kind of environment, because I think it opens up a whole new world. So one final thought, anything, uh, anything that we didn't touch upon that you're optimistic about as we look to the year ahead? I think I'm I'm super optimistic uh, to just see this opportunity for us. And I and again, I speak in industry here. Um, as we said earlier, like there is, we we have so many human touch points we're creating in travel and hospitality. Um, I think we have a we we're developing a kind of new era um, on the on the virtual side. And 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 as Lala was saying, this is really just the beginning. We wanted to start something. When you look at, uh, I mean, we we're talking about co-creation, collaboration. Uh, when you look into gaming, when you look into streaming, when you look into retail, they, that's all billion dollar comp, uh, industries. And and we in hospitality bring something to the table, which we, I think sometimes we tend to forget. Um, and I think if we get encouraged to co-create, collaborate, and taking these these new opportunities, which we get probably forced into because of this pandemic, um, I'm very optimistic. And I'm also optimistic that a lot of agents and travel advisors going through this journey when we interviewed them after that uh kind of the core theme was i'm a different person uh since i joined this journey four weeks ago and it and it gave me a toolkit it gave me a hope and it gave me a perspective um and and i think that's that's we're graving for this and, uh, and that, that's so positive and, and it gave them community. And I think that that was what was really reassuring and hopeful for me to just remember that like humans, we want to be connected uh, and we're going to find ways to do it no matter what. And that, you know, through those connections, we can just start to or continue to explore and, and redefine what's possible for us. Well, Marcus, Leilani, thank you guys so much. I really enjoyed this conversation and congratulations again on the win for Skift Idea Awards. Thank, thank you, you so much, Matt. Thank you so much, guys. That's the show, everybody. Thank you for sticking around with us for these conversations. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed it and feel inspired. Uh, feel like you have some new ideas brewing around there. Um, in a minute, we'll send you an email. We want this journey to continue, just like we left off in the last session. So, you know, feel free to reach out to us. Add to the Skip Design Resource Library. Uh, give us some feedback. Give us some more topics, some speakers, um, and let's keep this going. Thank you again, and good night. Thank you.